If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 26, Turmoil Regarding the construction of the academy, as I mentioned before, I want to build it in close proximity to Hogwarts to facilitate management and create a kind of academy city in that area. As explained to you earlier, I don't want the newly built Magic Academy to become just another school of magic. No, I want to establish something akin to a university in the Muggle world. My goal is to nurture in students the desire to explore and advance magic. I believe everyone present would agree that the potential for magical development exceeds that of technology, at least at this stage. Therefore, the layout of the academy will differ from Hogwarts. It won't be merely a grand castle. No. We will organize the construction of a main building for classes and activities. However, dormitories and research centers will be built separately. Since, according to my vision, the academy should accommodate a minimum of 45,000 students and 4,000 teachers, I must seek permission from the British government for construction. But I must emphasize, the Magic Academy will be an independent institution, unaffected by any government worldwide. This is my non-negotiable condition and is not up for discussion. The professors for the first stream of students will be individuals with the highest achievements in their respective fields. I have the honor to introduce them to you today. Let's welcome Gellert Grindelwald, Professor of Combat Magic and Duels. This course will replace the defense against the dark arts. I believe it's better to learn dark magic and know how to control it than to fear and defend against it. While this name may not carry much weight for non-magicians, in the magical world, he is considered one of the three strongest wizards. Proficient in dark magic, he will also serve as the deputy director of the academy. Newt's commander, professor of care of magical creatures. The author of numerous works on magical creatures, Hogwarts uses a textbook written by him. Florence, instructor of astronomy and divination. Yes, he's a centaur, and as all wizards know, centaurs are excellent seers. Aberforth Dumbledore, transfiguration professor. Yes, he's Dumbledore the younger brother of today's most powerful wizard. Horace Slughorn, Professor of Potion Making. One of the most renowned masters of potions in the magical world. Claudia Drongle, don't let her young age fool you, honestly, the Professor of Ancient Runes at Hogwarts wanted her to take her place. Herbert Beery, the former herbology professor at Hogwarts, retired due to age, but thanks to magical rings strengthening his body, he decided to return to the ranks of professors. William Ronan, the grandson of Abraham Ronan and the champion of magical duels last year. He will become the charms professor at the academy. Nicholas Flamel and his wife Pernell Flamel. I don't think they need an introduction, but still. Universally renowned wizard and alchemist of French origin, the only known creator of the Philosopher's Stone and the Elixir of Life, thanks to which Nicholas and his wife Pernell have lived for over 600 years. They will be teaching alchemy to our students. And so on. For nearly an hour renowned wizards took the stage one by one. In the end, approximately 150 wizards from all spheres of activity graced the stage. I can see doubt in your eyes. I mentioned 4,000 teachers. But, ladies and gentlemen, understand me. In the first year, only your children and relatives will be students. If we can gather even 10,000 people, that would be good. So, I believe that having around 150 teachers for now will be quite sufficient. What are your thoughts on this? In response to his question, applause erupted. People near the bar thought there was an earthquake. Naturally, not a single dissatisfied person was in the audience. Are you kidding? If everything the young man on stage said is true, then this faculty can be called the best in history. Their children will be taught by the world's finest wizards. Muggles were shocked, and even more so were the wizards working for these former muggles. They know exactly what each name mentioned today signifies. Such an assembly is enough to overthrow the International Wizarding Federation in a matter of hours. Thank you all for the warm welcome to our faculty. I am delighted to announce that we are ready to commence the construction of the Magic Academy, Elysium starting next week. With these words, the applause only intensified. So much so that if Asmodeus hadn't used a voice enhancement spell, even the people on stage wouldn't have heard him. He raised his hand to calm everyone and said. For today, that's all. We will get in touch with everyone tomorrow regarding financing and the commencement of construction. Today, you can return to your children and loved ones to let them know that they will soon become wizards. Once again, I thank all of you present for your support. As a memento of this day, I have prepared a gift for each of you. As he spoke, a pendant appeared before everyone. 
Half of the pendant was black, and the other half was golden. The pendant took the form of angel and devil wings enclosing a blue ruby in the middle. Take this pendant. It can protect you from an attack once. See you soon, comrades. Over the next week, there were two topics of conversation in the world. First, why did some key figures in the world receive identical pendants, and did these people join some society for world control? The second topic was about who was buying gold worldwide. The value of gold skyrocketed. If previously the price per kilogram of gold was $38,000, within a week, the prices soared to the 2023 level of $70,000 per kilogram. Although these two topics briefly dominated the media space, they quickly faded away. Chapter 27, Ministry's Reaction After their meeting, Asmodeus and Dumbledore gracefully returned to Hogwarts. Nevertheless, they would have to wait for financial support. Neither Asmodeus nor Dumbledore wished to exploit the Philosopher's Stones for gold a tactic deemed foolish. Firstly, only an imbecile would employ the Philosopher's Stone in such a manner. Secondly, Asmodeus aimed to bind these affluent muggles to his cause. To fully gain their allegiance, he needed them to comprehend what they could gain and what they could offer. In this arrangement, Asmodeus gained control over the future magical world educational system, while they gained the opportunity to become wizards. For this to happen, Asmodeus must share his knowledge, and they must contribute their resources. It's simple, cooperation based on mutual benefit is always more reliable than a one-sided deal. In reality, Asmodeus emerges the victor in this maneuver, especially considering that the stronger the world becomes, the more he stands to gain. Now, Asmodeus and Dumbledore must decide how to handle the Ministry of Magic. They didn't anticipate that the arrival of approximately 3,000 people in the village of Hogsmeade would go unnoticed. And, as it turned out, they were right. Ministry of Magic, England. Minister's Office. Damn it, what is Dumbledore doing? Why is there such a gathering at his brother's bar? Why wasn't I, the Minister of Magic, informed? Furious, Fudge paced around his office in a fit of rage. Despite his fear of Dumbledore and the knowledge of whose hand fed him, Fudge dared not ask him directly or express any discontent. However, he needed to understand why over 70 internationally renowned wizards had entered England in the past week. They all had one reason for their arrival and invitation to a meeting from Dumbledore. Unaware of any such gathering, Fudge didn't dare offend any of Dumbledore's guests, each either a scholar or a world-class wizard. The most he could do was to discreetly monitor one of them. What he witnessed was staggering within an hour, 2,500 people entered the Hogshead Inn. Forget the clearly unauthorized use of space-expanding charms, forget even the fact that these wizards had blatantly entered the territory of the Ministry of Magic in England illegally. But what was Dumbledore planning, inviting 2,500 people to a meeting? Clearly, these were not locals, many seemed foreign. Yet, he didn't recognize any of them. Unaware that most attendees were muggles, the thought didn't cross Fudge's mind. Moreover, except for attire, an average wizard couldn't discern magical abilities in a person. Hence, Fudge naturally assumed they were wizards. Fudge had already begun distancing himself from Dumbledore, especially after Grindelwald's release. He believed Dumbledore was gathering forces to oust him from the minister's position, unaware that for Dumbledore, he was no more than a beetle to be crushed at any moment. Today, Fudge found enough courage to write a letter to Dumbledore, demanding explanations. Little did he know that just when Dumbledore received the letter, someone openly disdainful of him would be by his side. Hogwarts, Headmaster's Office Asmodeus and Dumbledore discuss the layout of the future academy. I'm telling you, there should be a dragon breeding ground here. What child wouldn't want to be a knight riding a dragon? Asmodeus, we won't be allowed to do that, and taming dragons is no easy feat. Albus. This is my academy, I'm the headmaster. I want us to have a field for teaching children how to ride dragons. Dumbledore rubbed his aching temples. He couldn't argue against this point. The academy indeed belonged to Asmodeus, or more precisely, the Morning Star family, as specified in the land contract issued by Britain. However, he doubted that any muggle parents would allow their children to attend a school in the midst of a dragon farm. Moreover, he himself didn't want such neighbors. You know, the new academy will be located next to Hogwarts. If you fly on a broom, you can reach Elysium from Hogwarts in five minutes. It's no more than 15 kilometers away. Dumbledore doesn't want one of the students who took a joyride on broomsticks to end up as a dragon's meal. Elysium Academy should be built to the northeast of Hogwarts, 
the direction Quidditch players go when testing broomstick speed. Asmodeus contemptuously looked at the Dumbledore, thinking, so, you can build a dragon pen right next to Hogwarts, but I can't. But he said nothing. He was already considered a prophet among these old folks, one shouldn't overdo it, or they might start addressing him as the prophet later. Damn it, thought Asmodeus. Oh well, I really wanted to understand the difference between local dragons and the dragons of the Fire Nation. While these two stubborn individuals sat and stared at each other, an owl tapped on the window. Dumbledore stood up, opened the window, and the owl dropped a letter on the table before flying to the bowl set for all incoming owls. So many owls had arrived at Dumbledore's in the past week that he had no choice but to resort to this method. Opening the letter, Dumbledore read it and handed it to Asmodeus. Albus, my dear friend. It's me, your loyal comrade, Minister Fudge. Three days ago, the Ministry detected unusual activity in Hogsmeade and a significant influx of people at the Hogshead Inn. Some Ministry members are getting nervous and demand explanations from you. Could you please respond to them? Ha, what a pitiful sight. He didn't even dare to ask directly. I'm just amazed at you. How could you allow such a useless piece of crap in the Minister's chair? Well, you're exaggerating a bit, Asmodeus. Fudge isn't that bad, at least he was. At that time, I thought a weak minister who couldn't stir up trouble would be the better choice. Ha <laughs> ha, then you miscalculated in choosing people. I tell you, he's a dog biting the hand that feeds him. We should put our own person in the minister's position. Who? Do you already have a candidate? Asmodeus was surprised that Dumbledore wasn't against it and said, Amelia Bones would be suitable. I want to talk to her. If she agrees with our ideas, I'll be glad if a worthy person heads the Ministry of Magic. But I want a seat in the Wisengamot. Asmodeus, why do you need that? You'll already have enough power as the director of the first magical academy of a new format. Actually, I don't need it. Consider it as me just trying to ensure a good life for my descendants. Although I doubt I'll ever die. Death is just another journey, there's no need to run from it. But before Dumbledore could finish, Asmodeus interrupted him, No, Albus, death is a journey only for those who either don't see the point in living beyond it or don't enjoy life. For example, you don't enjoy life, and I think if it weren't for me, you would have chosen to die alongside Voldemort and end your journey in this world. But now look, you're planning a future as you envisioned your family together and want to live for that future. Right now, I have no intention of dying, and I think there will be plenty for me to do in the future. Perhaps you're right. Dumbledore murmured quietly. But what do we do with Fudge now? What's complicated about it? Capture him, lock him in a box, and let someone from the Saints take his place using a polyjuice potion until we find a suitable replacement and officially change the Minister of Magic for England. But Fudge hasn't done anything to be treated like this. Albus, believe me, he already thinks you're planning to remove him from the Minister's position. It seems he's right. It's not about that. I mean, since he has started showing signs of disobedience, just get rid of him. No need to kill him. Just let him serve as an ingredient for the polyjuice potion, and then we'll erase his memories of being a minister, and he can live his life. Even if someone in the magical world recognizes him, we'll just say he had a counter-reaction from some spell, and now he doesn't remember who he is. What's the problem? Hearing Asmodeus's words, Dumbledore sighed and said, Well, all right. Shall we go to the ministry? Yes, let's go. I want to see the pink toad dwelling there. Who? Oh, just someone, it doesn't matter. Chapter 28, Minister of Magic With a gentle pop, Asmodeus and Dumbledore appeared at the Ministry of Magic. The ministry, an eight-story structure with underground chambers, welcomes wizards daily through the atrium. Adorning the atrium is a grand magical brotherhood fountain, adorned with golden sculptures of a mage, sorceress, goblin, centaur, and house elf. Tradition dictates tossing small coins into the fountain, with these contributions going to St. Mungo's Hospital. From the atrium, one enters a small hall hosting no fewer than 20 lifts, as the ministry's expansive layout places various departments on different floors. The following are these departments in the order they divide the levels. In the hall, special fireplaces are positioned, on one side for entry and the other for exit. A duty wizard sits here, where non-ministry visitors must register, undergo inspection, and present their magical wand for scrutiny on a designated device. Each ministry employee carries an identification pass. 
Asmodeus and Dumbledore approached the registration desk, where Dumbledore said, Hello, Conan. Could you please issue a pass for this young man? He's invited by Fudge. Oh, Director Dumbledore, just wait a moment. I'll need to check his wand, replied Conan Greenwood. Uh, well, all right. What's this? He can't possibly be without a wand. Dumbledore exclaimed, slightly surprised. However, Asmodeus, who had returned to his twenty-year-old appearance, intervened. After the last time he used the rejuvenation potion, Asmodeus went back to Hogwarts, waved his hand, and ordered one hundred vials from Snape. Snape was furious, claiming he had no time for such low-level potions, but after a couple of thousand galleons, he reluctantly agreed. Uh, I think Director Dumbledore is referring to this, he said, pulling his staff slash wand from behind and placing it on the registration desk. Conan Greenwood. He looked at Asmodeus strangely, then shifted his gaze to Dumbledore with a facial expression asking, is this a joke? Ahem, Dumbledore coughed and said, well, his wand is a bit special. What the kind of wand is this? Screamed the inspector inwardly but still tried to pretend to examine and verify the wand. He described the wand's appearance and stamped the pass. Everything is ready, you are free to go. Holding the pass, Asmodeus and Dumbledore headed to one of the lifts, and Dumbledore said, Department of Magical Ministry Management. As the lift stopped after ascending one floor, Asmodeus, not quite remembering where the minister's office was, asked, Is the lift broken? Ha ha ha, no, no, we've arrived. The minister's office is on the first floor. What's the point of having a separate lift that goes up just one floor? Disdainfully remarked Asmodeus. Ahem, you should ask Evangeline Orpington about that, she introduced lifts to the Ministry of Magic. Isn't she the one who got involved in the Muggle War? Ahem, those are just rumors. All right, I don't care, it's just funny that the Ministry of Magic, existing to prevent contact between wizards and muggles, participated in a Muggle War. In the mid-19th century, the interaction between the Muggle and magical worlds became noticeable like never before, rapid technological progress scared wizards, but some non-magical inventions were introduced into magical life, such as the Hogwarts Express. It is believed that Evangeline Orpington, a friend of the Queen, magically intervened in the course of the Crimean War, and the next Minister of Magic resigned due to unfavorable relations with the British non-magical government. Asmodeus and Dumbledore conversed while walking through the Department of Magical Ministry Management the division in the British Ministry of Magic located on the first level, where the minister, his administration, and other leading figures of the ministry work directly. After a couple of minutes, Dumbledore and Asmodeus reached the minister's office, and Dumbledore knocked on the door. Knock, knock, knock. Come in, the door isn't locked. Sound of the door opening. Oh, Dumbledore, it's great to see you. You know, the aura department has been pressuring me about your meeting a couple of days ago. But don't worry, I stood up for you. Non-stop chatter began immediately after the door opened. Hearing what Fudge was saying, Asmodeus couldn't hide his undisguised contempt. He thought Fudge would at least have the courage to ask about it personally or not ask at all. But now he's clearly trying to shift all the responsibility onto the Aurors. And I'm pleased to see you, Cornelius. Albus, I need to know what to tell them about the sudden influx of wizards into England. You know, they all said they came to meet you, but they haven't left anywhere. So our Aurors are nervous, they think someone among the newcomers might be up to something. Cornelius, I can assure you that none of those who came at my invitation harbors ill intentions. We gathered in England to discuss the latest magical research. As Dumbledore continued to justify an attempt to be polite, Asmodeus couldn't bear it. Especially after seeing Fudge's combat power value determined by the system, three points. Do you even understand what that means? For a well-trained muggle, combat power is exactly one point. The combat power index grows exponentially, and one plus one doesn't mean two but five. According to Asmodeus's gathered data, a fifth-year Hogwarts student averages three to four points, and top graduates have five points of combat power. Aurors possess seven points. After magically enhancing his ring, Dumbledore raised his combat power to his peak from 40 years ago, 40 points. Thanks to ring enhancements, Asmodeus's combat power also rose to 32 points. And now Dumbledore, with his strength, is trying to explain something to a bug. Having lived for 18 years in a world of law supremacy, Asmodeus also lived in a war-torn world where everything is based on your own strength for 20 years. He leans more towards the form of governance, 
the stronger, the more important. He can't understand why the elephant is trying to reassure the mouse scared by its steps. You might perceive this as arrogance, but Asmodeus respects those stronger than him. With Dumbledore, Grindelwald, and Nico, he can jest but never demand or demean them. It's his respect for the strong. Asmodeus doesn't believe there's no place for the weak in the world or anything radical. No, he simply thinks everyone should know their place, especially in a world where personal combat power can surpass the strength of an army. He supports anyone who, in such conditions, strives to increase their strength and treats them with respect. Fudge, however, is practically indistinguishable in strength from a muggle for him. Yet, Fudge behaves as if he were an immensely important person in front of Dumbledore. Unable to contain himself any longer, he said, Albus, why are you explaining anything to him? He literally got into this position solely thanks to your support, it's his job to run after you. Hearing these words, Fudge's face contorted. Since becoming the minister, no one dared to address him like this, and he turned around to see where the voice was coming from. Initially, he didn't notice anyone else in the office besides Dumbledore, as Dumbledore was his main focus and he didn't pay attention. But now he turned around and saw that disdainful gaze directed at him, and he asked discontentedly. This young man lacks manners, whether with Dumbledore's support or without, I am the Minister of Magic, the most important person in England. Oh, do you think so? Asmodeus said playfully, and the disdain in his eyes only intensified. Dumbledore, who is this uncultured young man? Pointing at Asmodeus with disapproval in his voice, Fudge asked. I don't think you need to know. Asmodeus said before Dumbledore could answer. It's time to wrap this up, Dumbledore. He reached into his pocket, pulling out a small suitcase with a space expansion charm cast upon it. Newt's commander had given this suitcase to Asmodeus, hoping that if Asmodeus ever managed to enter the world of Avatar, he would bring back animals for him to study. But now, inside the suitcase, was one of Grindelwald's people, chosen to replace Fudge. Dumbledore sighed and pointed his wand at Fudge. Seeing this, Fudge paled. What are you going to do? I'm the Minister of Magic, you have no right. Help. Sorry, Cornelius, but you're no longer suitable for this position. Besides, no matter how loudly you shout, they won't hear you. Saying this, Asmodeus cast a spell that struck Fudge, causing him to lose consciousness. Seeing this, Asmodeus placed the suitcase on the floor and opened it. A middle-aged wizard emerged, saluting, and saying, I'm ready to take on the role at any moment. Excellent. Over there lies the one you'll be for the next year, Asmodeus said, pointing at Fudge. He handed three vials of polyjuice potion. You'll be receiving a new batch of polyjuice potion every week. Don't let anyone suspect that you're not Fudge. The man nodded, took out a trunk from his pocket, and placed Fudge inside. That's how, without any commotion, Dumbledore and Asmodeus replaced the Minister of Magic. Chapter 29 Squibs. Returning to Hogwarts, Dumbledore offered Asmodeus a cup of tea. Asmodeus, care for some tea? No. I actually wanted to talk about another group of people. You see, by focusing on muggles, we completely forgot about squibs. Dumbledore's face showed embarrassment and genuine surprise. You know. I've forgotten about them too. If you hadn't mentioned it, or if I hadn't seen Filch, I might have forgotten that we have a vast number of potentially loyal individuals. Lately, I've been concentrating on muggles and losing sight of wizards. Albus, approximately how many squibs are there in the wizarding world? Asmodeus asked somewhat suspiciously. He clearly doubted Dumbledore's use of the term vast number and didn't expect Dumbledore to say just a couple of thousand. I don't know the exact number worldwide, but I have a rough idea of the number of squibs in England. Although my information may be outdated. You know what, let's find out from Squib himself. While Asmodeus and Dumbledore waited for Filch, who had been summoned by the portraits, Asmodeus pondered. Squibs are essentially wizards unable to use magic. In the Harry Potter world, wizards rely on the magical mana in their bodies and the mana floating in the air. Although, except for wizards of Dumbledore's level, no one can feel mana, the magic circle helps muggles sense mana and use it. Until the construction of three rings around the heart, Muggles will have to rely on mana that has already been collected in the heart. Therefore, at the initial stages, the magic circle for wizards will be weaker than the original. However, this situation will change thanks to the physical advantage and the ability to use mana from the air again. Although wizards in the world of Harry Potter unconsciously use mana, 
muggles who become wizards will be fully aware of the existence of mana. Now, about squibs, a person born into a wizarding family but completely lacking magical abilities. Though it should be acknowledged that squibs have broader possibilities than muggles. For example, they can see dementors, communicate with animals on a higher level, there is an obvious connection between Argus Filch and Mrs. Norris, as well as between Arabella Fig and Mr. Tibbles. Squibs can also see enchanted buildings, Mr. Filch successfully works at Hogwarts and even uses the Room of Requirement, while ordinary muggles see only ancient ruins in the castle's place. There's a theory that muggle-born wizards come from squibs who married muggles, magical abilities may suddenly manifest through several generations. Asmodeus thinks this might be true, as he believes that all wizards in the Harry Potter world have a common ancestor, or at least a group of ancestors in the form of the first wizards. In these musings, Asmodeus awaited Filch. Headmaster Dumbledore, did you summon me? Yes, Argus, honestly, Asmodeus and I have a question that perhaps only you can answer. I'll be happy to help you, Director. All right, Filch, could you please tell me how many squibs are registered in England, and where they gather? Hearing Dumbledore's words, Filch's face showed genuine surprise. He never thought that the great wizard Dumbledore would be interested in information about the shame of the wizarding world. Mr. Director, in the late 19th century, the Society for Support of Squibs appeared in England, founded by Idris Okbai. It's still functioning. The last time I was there was seven years ago, and although I don't know the exact number of people there, I can assure you there are no fewer squibs in England than wizards themselves. Almost every wizarding family has or had a squib, it's just that wizarding families carefully hide it. Hearing Filch's words, Asmodeus asked, Mr. Filch, what do you think these squibs would be willing to give in return for the opportunity to become wizards? With genuine interest. You, you're not joking. Filch asked hopefully. I'm asking entirely seriously. Then I'm ready to answer for myself I'm willing to give everything I have. And I'm sure that most squibs feel the same way. All right, very well. Come here, I'll make you a wizard. Fifteen minutes later, Argus Filch sat in the chair and wept with joy. Just using Asmodeus's wand, he managed to perform the levitation spell. Asmodeus, on the other hand, was extremely surprised by the effectiveness of using magic rings on squibs. Forming the first magic ring, Filch, in the eyes of Asmodeus and Dumbledore, did not differ from an average middle-aged wizard. And the most astonishing thing was that even the magic ring that was supposed to remain around the heart somehow disappeared but didn't disappear without a trace. Instead, it dissolved into Filch's body. As Asmodeus understood, squibs differ from wizards in that their magical chains are damaged, and such a ring replaces the damaged parts, restoring the integrity of the squib's magical chain. Although not every squib would be able to become a wizard after forming the first ring, Asmodeus believes that the maximum level of damage to the magical chain can be healed with two rings. Furthermore, squibs, unlike muggles, already have mana in their bodies and possess abilities to control mana in space, albeit not functional. Thus, Asmodeus decided to take advantage of the time before the announcement of mana rings to the public and subdue the squibs. He would make an unbreakable vow with each squib. The conditions will be as follows, upon successfully becoming a wizard, the squib agrees to be loyal to the Morning Star family and never harm their interests. This way, Asmodeus will gain a large number of loyal subordinates in a short period. Honestly, even without an unbreakable vow, many squibs would be willing to give their lives for him. For example, someone like Filch sees Asmodeus not just as a wizard but as a god. However, Asmodeus doesn't intend to take such risks, he'd rather be cautious. After careful consideration, Asmodeus turned to Filch, Argus, go and tell all the squibs you know that I can heal them, on the condition that they remain loyal to me. Additionally, here, take 100 galleons. It should be enough for a wand and some decent clothes. Thank you very much, Mr. Morningstar. I won't let you down. Filch said quietly through tears of happiness and immediately headed towards the door of the headmaster's office. Chapter 30, In Pursuit of the Philosopher's Stone As Filch departed, Asmodeus inquired of Dumbledore, have you gathered all the horcruxes? Yes, except for the snake you mentioned. I hope Voldemort hasn't managed to create the seventh horcrux, as we speculated. Even if there's one horcrux left, it won't affect our plan. After his rebirth using the final horcrux, he'll be rendered useless, taking into account his fear of death and damaged soul. He'll be nothing more than a specter, able to touch the material world and shoot green beams from his wand indiscriminately. Moreover, I have a sense that by harming his own soul, 
he has closed off any further paths of growth. He'll be perpetually stuck in this state, unable to strengthen himself. Besides, you're at the peak of your form again, what are you worried about? Perhaps you're right. I just don't want any more innocent victims. Then you should have killed him on the spot when you saw him at the orphanage. There's no use regretting a past that can't be changed. Sighing, Dumbledore nodded but asked again, Are you absolutely sure you can separate the Horcrux from Harry's soul? 100%, I have complete confidence in my method. Of course, I'm sure, damn sure. Asmodeus screamed within himself. I spent a whopping 500 points on a single spell. Damn, that's half of what I've accumulated in the last month. When do you plan to begin? Honestly, I was thinking of waiting until Christmas break, but I believe we can expedite the process. Listen, make sure Harry hears XXXXX and XXXX, Hagrid. After a couple of months of preparation, Asmodeus was ready to start his plan. In the evening, at the Great Hall, Harry and Ron, wearing somber expressions, consumed their dinner, contemplating how to prevent Snape from stealing the Philosopher's Stone. Although it was much more challenging for this duo to find clues about Nicholas Flamel without Hermione's assistance, Harry recently found a card of Dumbledore in a chocolate frog. They learned that Nicholas Flamel was a great alchemist who created a magical stone capable of turning base metals into gold and granting immortality. Moreover, before dinner, Harry discovered that Hagrid might have inadvertently leaked information on how to deal with the three-headed dog. After dining, they headed to Professor McGonagall to report Snape's attempt to steal the Philosopher's Stone. Why not directly to Dumbledore? They hadn't seen Dumbledore at dinner for the past two days. Poor kids, Asmodeus had long asked Dumbledore to leave the school and return only when he wrote. In such a state of mind, Harry failed to notice that when he placed his wand on the table while eating, it seemed to have subtly changed, either externally or internally. However, Harry couldn't sense it without comparing two wands immediately. While Harry and Ron sought Professor McGonagall, Asmodeus, with the help of alchemical devices provided by Nicholas, quietly began to monitor Quirrell. Exactly at ten. Quirrell's office. Asmodeus wore a mask concealing his breath. An invisibility cloak, not like Harry's, but a regular one with clasps on the edges, making it look like a long jacket with a hood. On his feet were mad boots, one of Nicholas's old inventions from his youth when he wanted to rob some nobleman, ahem, let's not delve into the dark history of the world's greatest alchemist. Thanks to this gear, several layers of concealment magic, and an enhanced spell of muggle repulsion, cast on him by Dumbledore but reversed to repel wizards, Asmodeus became more than just an invisible man. It felt as if he had dissolved into space, and even Voldemort wouldn't be able to find him without special preparation. Quirrell nervously prepared to leave, stuffing various potions and items into his pockets. The master told me to start right away. Relax, Snape has stopped paying attention to me lately, and Dumbledore hasn't shown up at Hogwarts for a long time. Tonight is the perfect time, Quirrell thought, comforting himself. So, Quirrell and the invisible Asmodeus quietly moved through the fourth floor corridor. They encountered no one on the way. Forget about Filch. Not even a ghost was seen. It was all the result of Asmodeus's preparation, just to ensure Quirrell or Voldemort wouldn't harm any students or castle inhabitants. However, Quirrell was both excited and oppressed. Excited about the future life if successful and oppressed by thoughts of what lay ahead. Thus, he didn't notice the strange silence around him. He created a miniature harp through transfiguration and silently unlocked the door in front of him with the unlocking charm. Quirrell pushed the wooden door open. In the dark room. A tall figure suddenly leaped up. The stench hit Quirrell in the face. Fluffy, the three-headed dog, was about to pounce. Quirrell quickly grabbed the harp in his hand. The once fierce beast soon fell asleep silently. How could this big guy have such a fatal weakness, thought Asmodeus. Quirrell opened the door which the dog had been sitting on just moments ago. A large dark hole was revealed beyond. Quirrell, without hesitation, jumped down, and Asmodeus quietly followed him. Luckily, he had brought an invisible flying broom made by Nicholas. Otherwise, he would have had to either jump down head first, like Quirrell or use his own method of flight. But if he flew using flames, as he could, he was afraid not only the devilish net below would burn but also Quirrell beneath him. Quietly descending, Asmodeus heard a faint laughter. Ha ha ha, Dumbledore is foolish. He really relaxed at this time, so I finally have the opportunity to steal the Philosopher's Stone. When they find out about the stone's disappearance, 
I'll already have returned my master to life. Soon, very soon, the master will be resurrected. I... I will also get what I want. Then Quirrell suddenly shuddered, horror reflected on his face. Asmodeus guessed that Voldemort had just berated Quirrell. Asmodeus felt he deserved the reprimand. Who asked you to set red flags right in the middle of the task? Quirrell didn't dare to speak any more. He went straight to the stone corridor in front of him. This corridor gradually leads people underground. Even streaks on the walls. At the end of the corridor is a brightly lit room with a swarm of enchanted keys flying near the ceiling. On the other side of the room is a door with a large lock. Quirrell pointed his wand upward and cast the spell Arresto Momentum, freezing the keys in mid-air. But he didn't stop there, he pointed his wand upward again and said, Oxyo key to the door. Professor McGonagall's room with living chess pieces guarding the passage to the next room was swiftly bypassed with a confundus charm. In his own room, Quirrell simply cast a Petrificus Totalus on the troll. Since the old giant troll had been replaced by a young one who hadn't yet grown, interesting, why did they have to replace the troll? After the troll, there was Professor Snape's room, containing a table with seven vials and a parchment with the conditions of a logic puzzle. Only the potion from one vial allowed passage through the cold flames that covered the final passage. Asmodeus wondered how much time Quirrell would spend on this. After five minutes of contemplation, the poor thief couldn't decipher this second grade level riddle. Apparently, Voldemort had to provide hints, as Asmodeus clearly saw Quirrell flinch. Drinking one of the potion bottles, Quirrell passed through the fire. Asmodeus didn't need to drink any potion are you kidding? He's a fire mage. The flames simply parted softly before him, and Asmodeus controlled them so that the fire didn't look suspicious to Voldemort sitting on Quirrell's head. A burst of fire occurred, revealing a new room in front of Asmodeus. This room was circular, with a massive mirror in the center. Meanwhile, Quirrell was anxiously pacing around the mirror. It was nothing like what he had imagined. In his mind, shouldn't the Philosopher's Stone be on some pedestal or in a chest? Why was there only one mirror in the room? What about the Philosopher's Stone? Quirrell was now panicking. He sneaked in here tonight, it was, in fact, his only chance. If he couldn't find the Philosopher's Stone, even if Dumbledore didn't learn of his betrayal, his own master would torture him to death. Quirrell looked at the mirror in front of him, his face expressing bewilderment. This mirror was truly strange. He saw in the mirror that he presented the Philosopher's Stone to his master, and his master was resurrected. He rewarded him. The Death Eaters around him looked at him with envy in their eyes. It was so beautiful. Just a scene in the mirror. But what about the Philosopher's Stone? At this moment, Quirrell already felt Voldemort's consciousness growing impatient. He quickly pulled out his wand and began casting various detection charms. He was sure it was Dumbledore's trick. He had to be able to crack it. Asmodeus stood aside, watching Quirrell dart around the mirror. It was the Mirror of Ereast inside which Dumbledore had hidden the Philosopher's Stone. In the mirror, people could see what they desire most in their hearts. Harry saw his parents, Ron saw himself as head boy, leading the Greyfinder Quidditch team to victory. Asmodeus was curious about what he would see in the mirror but decided to leave it for later. In any case, he didn't believe that Dumbledore hadn't placed any protective charms on the mirror. Therefore, he wasn't worried that the mirror would break during the battle. Allow me to do this, useless idiot said Voldemort, preparing to take control of Quirrell's body. Just then, a whoosh sound echoed behind them. Flames flickered. A figure emerged from the fire. Harry found himself in a large room with the mirror of Ereast in the middle. In the center stood an adult. But when he turned around, it wasn't Snape but Quirrell. You? No, it can't be, that was Snape. He, he was. Haha, <laughs> yes, he doesn't look like a good person. But next to him, who would suspect the stuttering Professor Quirrell? Quirrell said with a smirk. But during the Quidditch match, Snape tried to kill me. Ha ha ha, oh, foolish boy. I. I was the one who wanted to kill you. And if it weren't for Snape and his counter curse, I would have succeeded. Snape tried to protect me. Strangely enough, yes. It was Snape who hindered me all this time. And that dreadful child Asmodeus, you know. Snape immediately came here when he heard about the troll and didn't fall for my trick. But because that bastard Asmodeus killed my troll so quickly, I couldn't do anything. After that, he never took his eyes off me, and I barely escaped today. But here I am, standing in front of the mirror. 
I see myself in the mirror holding the philosopher's stone. But how do I get it? After Quirrell's scream, a voice emanated from somewhere, saying, Use the boy. Come here, Potter. Right now. Harry descended the stairs to the mirror. Now tell me what you see. I, I am shaking hands with Dumbledore and winning the Academy Cup. He, is lying. Speak, Potter, what do you see? I, I'm telling the truth. Let me talk to him. But, Master, you are not strong enough right now. Do as you're told. Quirrell removed the turban. And Harry saw Voldemort's reflection in the mirror, looking at him. It was clear that Voldemort wanted to speak with the boy who turned him into what he is now, over ten years ago. At that moment, Harry was terrified by Voldemort on the back of Quirrell. He had never seen a face so dreadful. The visage was pale as chalk, and his red eyes glowed intensely. Below, two slender serpent-like nostrils were positioned. Harry Potter, Voldemort's whisper made Harry want to step back, but his feet seemed to defy control. Look at what I've become. Voldemort roared, all that remains is this soul. The ability to converse only emerges when I share a body with someone else. But, once I acquire the Philosopher's Stone and the Elixir of Life, I'll be able to recreate my own body. Well, this little trick of Dumbledore's, you must know how to solve it, don't you? Go, take out the Philosopher's Stone and give it to me. Harry recoiled. How could he honestly listen to Voldemort? Don't be a fool. Better help me. Do as you're told. Otherwise, you'll end up like your parents. Before their deaths, they begged me to spare their lives. Initially, Harry was still frightened. But upon hearing this statement, an explosion of anger suddenly ignited in his heart. Nonsense. You're lying. Harry exclaimed loudly. He he, how touching. I always admired bravery. Yes, I admit your parents were very brave then. Your father died in a duel with me. And your mother. She didn't need to die. I promised a faithful servant to save her life. But, she defended you till the end. Well, hurry up and do as I say, don't let your mother die in vain. Chapter 31, Confronting Voldemort Voldemort couldn't get the Philosopher's Stone and was now very anxious. He knew if there was anyone Dumbledore would allow to take the stone, it would be Harry. So, on Voldemort's command, Quirrell hurried towards Harry. But out of nowhere, a leg appeared. Quirrell fell face first on the step next to Harry. A dreadful scream echoed, expressing the agony of his shattered face. A -a 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 -a, how painful! Who, where are you, bastard, come out, I'll kill you! Quirrell, trying to stand up with one hand covering his face, screamed in agony. Then applause rang out. The rhythmic claps gradually approached Harry and Quirrell until they clearly saw the source of the sound. Asmodeus! Harry exclaimed joyfully. Mr. Morningstar. Quirrell and Voldemort whispered quietly. Yes, it's me. Hello, Harry, he said, nodding gently to Harry. Quite a show you've put on, Mr. Voldemort, he said with a touch of sarcasm. Asmodeus Norin Morningstar, I noticed you during the sorting, and how you dealt with the troll intrigued me. Achieving such results with ordinary fire, I was very surprised. Oh, thank you for your praise, Mr. Voldemort. Kid. I see potential and strength in you. If you want to join me, I'll be happy to welcome you. To join you? In your current state. Asmodeus smirked. It's temporary. Once I get the Philosopher's Stone. I'll regain my body and kill Dumbledore. Forgive me, Mr. Dark Lord, but I don't like your idea of purity. So, I'll have to interfere. How unfortunate that, in that case, you'll have to die, Voldemort said with a disappointed expression. Avada Kedavra A.A. Fiend fire, Asmodeus quietly uttered. He waved his hand, and it was the first time he cast a fire spell in this world. For someone like Asmodeus, who could use fire magic without wands and incantations, uttering a spell meant he was exerting himself to the fullest. Before Asmodeus, a wall of burgundy black flames appeared. Voldemort's spell evaporated instantly as it approached the wall. You, you're not a student. Where do you get such power? Voldemort shouted loudly. Avada ki davre a a, Avada, ki davre a a, he continued casting spells at Asmodeus. But no matter how hard he tried, before the spell could touch Asmodeus, the green color vanished in black flames. Voldemort simply couldn't believe it. 
even though he was weakened and using Quirrell's body, he was much stronger than Quirrell in this state. This method of blocking his spells was inaccessible to anyone in the world. Because to suppress his spell in this way, it meant Asmodeus had more mana at his disposal. No, no, this is impossible. Even Dumbledore doesn't have so much magical power. Why can you use so much mana? Voldemort roared in rage and disbelief. To reach a level where he could compete with Dumbledore, Voldemort underwent numerous body modifications and turned into a faceless monster. But now, in front of him stood a 13-14-year-old boy who overwhelmed him in terms of pure magic power. All right, time to finish this, Asmodeus said effortlessly, as if the battle with Voldemort hadn't drained him at all. Managing the shield of fire with his left hand, Asmodeus raised his right hand towards where Voldemort stood and said, Mr. Dark Lord, try my enhanced fire summoning spell, Incendio Diabolico. From Asmodeus's hand, a blood-red flame erupted, which literally vaporized Quirrell's body in seconds. Even one of the columns behind him melted, and it was made of stone. Harry, help me! Asmodeus shouted towards him. Use any spell you know. Harry, who already saw that there was nothing left of Quirrell and Voldemort but ashes, didn't understand why he needed to do anything. Still, he obeyed this pyromancer Ravenclaw student. Harry raised his wand and pointed it to where Quirrell used to stand. He shouted, Wingardium Leviosa. It was the only spell he knew at the moment, thanks to Professor Flitwick. What do you expect from him? Events accelerated due to Asmodeus. Instead of a year of preparation, Harry had only five months. But when Harry thought the spell he learned was useless in this situation, he realized there was something wrong with his wand. He clearly felt that the wand was extracting something from his body and collecting it at the tip. Before he could react, blue flames erupted from his wand. To his surprise, he saw a mist gathering and forming a figure in the place where he directed the fire. You can't kill me. Eh ah, ah what the hell, I'm on fire. No, no, no. After a while Voldemort's voice finally fell silent. However, Asmodeus didn't stop there. He approached Harry and said, Harry, get ready to cast that spell again. Harry nodded, realizing that something was off with Voldemort's condition, and he wouldn't simply die like that. While Harry contemplated, Asmodeus pulled out his Newt's briefcase from his pocket and spilled all the horcruxes out. Harry, burn them. Hum, Wingardium Leviosa. Furious screams erupted from the pile of items, but they quickly subsided. Now, Harry, you'll feel a bit strange, but as soon as you can, return to your body and use this magic on him again. As Harry heard Asmodeus's words, there were only three question marks in his head. Return to his body? What the hell does that mean? However, before he could ask, he felt someone push him in the chest. Eh, a a a a, I'm a ghost. I'm dead. No, stop, wait, is that what he meant by returning to the body? But who's the second one he mentioned? He pondered, but continued his subconscious movement toward his body. Back in his body, he heard Asmodeus shout, Come on, Harry, he's right behind you. Harry turned around and saw something in between himself and Voldemort. More precisely, half of this creature's face resembled Voldemort, and the other half was like his own. Without hesitation, he shouted again, Wingardium Leviosa, and the flames consumed the last Horcrux. No, no, I can't die like this. No. Triple A. As the Horcrux which shared a body with Harry, disappeared, Harry lost consciousness. Asmodeus supported him to prevent him from hitting his head on the floor and gently laid him down. Ha, I was right. He didn't manage to make the last horcrux, he muttered as he saw the system panel before his eyes. Ding, task series, kill Voldemort. Ding, each horcrux destroyed rewards 1000 points. When the system confirms Voldemort's complete death, a separate reward of 10,000 points will be available. Asmodeus received a reward of 7000 points for all the horcruxes destroyed, plus 10,000 for completing the task of killing Voldemort. Joyfully humming. Asmodeus lifted Harry with his favorite spell, as he understood, Wingardium Leviosa, and headed towards the school nurse. But as he was about to leave the room, he stopped and returned to where Harry had lain earlier. He looked around and spotted the wand lying near the steps. There you are. It would be a shame to lose you, he said, picking up the wand. You know, he, Nico, Grindelwald, and Dumbledore had worked on making this wand together for almost three weeks. It can only cast one spell and extracts mana from the user. 
This enhanced flame spell was developed by him and Grindelwald together. It combines the heat of Asmodeus's fire and the malleability of Grindelwald's fire, and it can also burn souls. That's why a few hours ago, Asmodeus switched Harry's wand with this one. Putting the wand in his pocket, Asmodeus took out Harry's original wand from his suitcase. He placed it in Potter's pocket and continued on his way. He decided he would look into the mirror later when he had the time. Chapter 32, Chapter 32, Beginning of Construction and Trading Center While Harry was recovering and Asmodeus spent time in the library absorbing knowledge through the system and occasionally strolling with Hermione. Dumbledore, Grindelwald and other elders were extremely busy. Asmodeus' requirements for the future academy were too high, and they didn't even know where to start construction. Gellert, we need to start construction, you know, the academy is supposed to admit its first students in nine months, and we haven't even begun building the main castle. Go tell that to Asmodeus. Damn him, who wrote this plan? What the hell is this magical creature breeding plan? What are those magical towers around the castle? And why did he mention 45,000 students? Grindelwald responded with frustration to Dumbledore. Ahem, ahem. I really don't want to see him lately. I have a feeling he's targeting my beard, I don't know why, but I have this premonition that he wants to do something with it. And because of that, you don't want to consult with him. All right, all right. Calm down, we really need to start construction. And I finally understood what those mage towers he was talking about are. Nicholas intervened in the conversation. Two gazes fell upon him. Ahem, ahem, mage towers, in ancient times, wizards built them for conducting research. It was like a home for powerful wizards. Each floor had a different purpose, but they haven't been built for a long time because during the witch hunts, many of such towers were destroyed, and the muggle expulsion spell didn't exist yet, so wizards gradually stopped building them. Also, with the advent of magic schools, wizards stopped living ascetically and gradually began forming villages. The towers were used so long ago that even I didn't know about them until I found it in an ancient magical book from the times of Merlin. Why does he need it in the school? I don't know. Our task is to build a tower, I've already contacted Asmodeus, and he said he'll enchant and improve them himself later. All right then. So, shall we start with the main castle? Yes, it's time to begin construction. Will the main entrance be in the southeast? Yes, Asmodeus said he doesn't care. If it makes it easier for wizards, we can arrange the castle however we want. Then in the southeast, there's a cliff to the north, and to climb from that side, we'll need to build stairs. So, it's better to place the entrance facing that lowland. Ah, so much work, why are we working while he's relaxing at Hogwarts? Ah, three consecutive sighs echoed. Amidst sorrow and frustration, the construction of the future center of the world began. While the elders worked, Asmodeus, having spent over 1,000 points on comprehensive learning in all available subjects at Hogwarts, lay on his bed, digesting knowledge. Ah, my head hurts. But now I understand the magic of this world as well as Dumbledore and Grindelwald. All right, I should probably see what the system has to offer. System. Open the trading center. Ding, at the host's request, the trading center is open. In front of Asmodeus' eyes appeared the familiar 4x4 grid where he had bought a set of books months ago to transform muggles into wizards. Sort out only what I can afford to buy. Ding, the host's balance is 15,345 points. Removing offers from the trading center that exceed this price. Potion of pet development, 700 points. Allows maximum acceleration of pet growth and unleashes its full potential. Guide to pyromancy in the world of Sailor Moon. The ability to gain insight into a question or situation using fire slash heat. Sub power of fire magic. Technique of fire manipulation. Variation of elemental divination. 3000 points. Hellfire magic, Ifrit, ability to use hellfire magic. Form of magic. Variation of fire magic and manipulation of infernal flames. Opposite of sacred fire magic, 15000 points. Holy fire magic, Zelda the power to use holy fire related magic form of magic variation of fire magic and holy fire manipulation opposite to hell fire magic 15000 points potion of lineage fusion 5000 points lineage of the vermilion family black clover 15000 points fire elementalization allows the user to take the form of a fire elemental in this state 
physical attacks do not affect the user. Fire magic damage is increased by 20% in the elementalized state. Fire magic consumes 15% less mana. Control over flames is increased by 50%, 5,500 points. Note, minimum requirement for elementalization is 1,000 points of mana for the owner. Mana is not consumed all at once but gradually until the host returns to normal state. Current mana reserve of the host, 1,250, meets the requirements. Small potion of permanent mana increase by 100 points, price, 1,000 points. One person can take only three potions per year, developing resistance to the potion after nine bottles. Small potion of physique reinforcement, increases all basic body characteristics by five points, price, 1,000 points. One person can take only three potions per year, developing resistance to the potion after nine bottles. One level world enhancement, 10,000 points. Raises the world level once. Improvement in all aspects, the amount of mana in the air, its quality, the physical preparation of average beings in the world, magical creatures becoming stronger and etc. Angel's Tear Potion, brings the deceased back to life if no more than a year has passed, 5,000 points. World level increase, by half a level. Price 5,000 points. With the constant flickering of products in front of his eyes, Asmodeus feared an epileptic seizure. However, he had already chosen the items he wanted to buy. By flame elementalization, small potion of permanent mana increase x3, and small potion of physique reinforcement x1. Ding, confirming the operation, deducted 9000 points. Current balance, 6345 points. Thank you for your purchase. With the sound of the system, Asmodeus felt that something in his body began to change. Before he could do anything, he lost consciousness. After a couple of hours, Asmodeus woke up and attempted to stand up from the floor. Ugh, my head is splitting, damn it, my whole body is convulsing. Hiss, maybe I shouldn't have, ah, uh, I'm falling, or not falling. As Asmodeus tried to get back on his feet, he slipped, but before he could fall, he involuntarily transformed into an elemental. Convenient. Chapter 33, Chapter 33, Universal Enhancements Experiencing the skill Flame Elementalization, Asmodeus noticed four small bottles lying before him. Three potions for a constant increase in mana and one elixir for enhancing his physic. Without much hesitation, Asmodeus took the small body strengthening potion in his hands, drank it, and sat on the bed in his room, awaiting the effects. The wait wasn't long, after a couple of minutes, Asmodeus felt as if the blood in his veins began to simmer. Yet, it wasn't an unpleasant sensation, rather, it was akin to sitting in a luxurious finished sauna while someone stoked the heat. After 15 minutes, the sensation subsided, and Asmodeus realized that the process of fortifying his physique had concluded. Before checking his stats in the system and examining his body, he decided to take a shower. The stench was unpleasant, and impurities accumulated over years of life, reminiscent of Chinese novels from his past existence, washed away with his sweat. Returning from the shower, Asmodeus inspected his body. While he had always stood out for his height at his age, now, if not for his youthful face, he could easily be mistaken for a beach bodybuilding class competitor. Every muscle line was sharply defined, and fat on his body was almost non-existent. He reverted to the physique he had before entering this world, but now, this body was only 14 years old, indicating that the potential for natural growth was not yet exhausted. To be honest, his current appearance resembles that of a 16-year-old athlete. His face has matured though not as significantly as his body. Moreover, it hasn't aged, it has grown, turning him into a young man rather than a tall child. Although explaining such a transformation to Hermione and the elders might be challenging, he'll simply mention experimenting with a potion for physical enhancement that went awry. All right, that's done. Looks like it's time for you, he said, eyeing the mana bottles. Athena. My master has gone mad, talking to bottles. Ignoring Athena's puzzled look, he took all three bottles and consumed them in one go. Oddly, the familiar warmth didn't follow as before. Instead, he felt as if a spring breeze was gently blowing over him. When Asmodeus sensed the potion's effects had worn off, he shouted, System, display my stats. Ding, current host statistics. 1 combat power, 37. 2 health, 150 150. 3 mana, 1550 1550. 4 Strength, 26. 
5 Agility, 22. 6 Intelligence, 35. Wow, a real improvement, and even combat power has increased. 1550 mana is sufficient for full-fledged combat in elemental state and provides a reserve for magic usage, Asmodeus muttered. System, display Athena's stats. Ding, Athena, Wyvern. Lineage, Wyverns, with a high threshold for peak combat power and potential evolutions, 20% of lineage potential is currently activated. 1 combat power, 7. 2 health, 50 fiftieths. 3 mana, 100 slash 100. 4 strength, 11. 5 agility, 25. 6 intelligence, 7. You've become stronger without doing anything, he said with a smile, patting the now larger Athena. If he could easily hold her like a cat before, now it's not just challenging to lift her, she's simply too big to pet while she's in his arms. Athena is now a wyvern the size of a large dog, not yet as huge as a horse but definitely not small. Well, when Athena grows to the point where she can't walk around the castle, I'll move her to Elysium. In any case, I'll be spending a lot of time there, thought Asmodeus. Ah, I need to talk to the old man today. He remembered that since the new generation of wizards would need wands or, as he decided to call them, magical weapons, he had to find people who could craft them. 1.30 p.m. at the Hog's Head Inn. Oh, here comes our irresponsible director. Shouted Grindelwald with a glass of wine in hand, surrounded by several teachers of the future academy. You're the irresponsible one, I've given you everything you need for construction, resources, finances, knowledge, and even found students in advance. Sound of a cough. Grindelwald coughed at such a harsh response. All right, folks, we didn't gather here today to point fingers, especially since Grindelwald is to blame. We're here to decide what to do about the fact that incoming students will also need to buy magical weapons, cauldrons, robes, and so on. And in Diagon Alley, there won't just be a lack of space for all the incoming students, but also not enough goods and shops. Said Nicholas. Grindelwald, I sense undisguised malice. Nico. Who do you think among your students can manufacture magical weapons? Most of my students are either dead or working on their inventions, but they have children willing to learn the technique of crafting magical weapons and get to work. They are also willing to sign a contract with the Academy as a priority client and an unbreakable non-disclosure agreement about the method of crafting magical weapons outside the family, but they also want to become something like Ollivander's family with his wands. I believe their conditions are quite justified, but the problem is that one family won't be enough. Ha ha ha, don't worry, my student turned out to be very prolific. He has 25 grandchildren, and they have good family relations, so they'll have enough people. What's your student's name? Hugh Benishu. He's working on studying alchemical runes and their interaction with electricity, aiming to transform muggle tools. Sadly, he hasn't figured out how to make a TV work with magic yet. It became his obsession after seeing a TV in a muggle store. Nico. Do you think he needs financial investment or any assistance? I see potential in his research. Who do you think I am? Although I don't bury him in gold, what he learned from me is enough for him to live comfortably for the rest of his life. Once a month, he produces some alchemical tools and sells them, he has no money problems at all, and resources for his research are delivered for a fee from the best sources. Cough, cough, all right, don't get nervous, you're old. I just wanted to help him. Hmm, Nicholas grunted dissatisfied. So when can we meet his grandchildren? Are they arriving soon? They're already here, waiting in the guest room. Then let's go meet them. Ascending the stairs and opening the door, Asmodeus saw the true meaning of the phrase strong seed that Jonaran from the world of ice and fire once mentioned. Twenty-five men who looked almost identical short black hair, unremarkable appearance, dressed in dark blue jackets, as if he had stumbled upon a clone factory. Here the grandchildren of my student. From left to right, Albert, Baptiste, Veronique, Gabriel, Damien, Giselle, Gerard, and so on. Uh, good day, everyone. As I understand, you're ready to take on the task of crafting magical weapons for incoming students at my academy. Yes, Mr. Morningstar, on the condition that the Benisha family receives exclusive rights to manufacture magical weapons in Europe. To be honest, if you had said in England and France, I would have agreed immediately but we're talking about all of Europe. Are you sure you can handle such a load? People from all over the world are now enrolling in the academy, and there are many compared to the previous number of wizards. 
what if instead of 5,000 weapons, as it is now, you have to make weapons for 50,000? Do you really think you can keep up with the demands of buyers? Upon hearing Asmodeus's words, they all slumped a bit. They hadn't thought about the possibility of not being able to cope with future demand, they were merely trying to grab as big a piece as possible. Seeing this, Asmodeus continued, let's do this, I'll grant your family exclusive rights to open an alchemical forge right at the academy, and I'll give you the best spot on the trading street near the academy. You can also advertise your alchemical forge as approved by Elysium Academy. Also, your family will sign a contract for the out-of-turn production of weapons for Morningstar family members three weapons per year. Don't forget, I'm providing you with the complete method of manufacturing magical weapons. After that, you'll have to research and improve your knowledge and methodology of production. And I don't commit to not disclosing the basic technique of making magical weapons. I'm giving it to you first, the rest depends on your efforts. Well, are you in agreement? We agree, but on the condition that the Morningstar family or the Academy prepare a contract similar to Hogwarts with all Ivander. That is, weapons will be sold to people from low-income families at the Academy's expense. All right, so be it. Deal. Asmodeus shook hands with each member of the Benisha family. You can approach Grindelwald to get a place for opening the forge in the Academy, I'll inform him. As for the branch on the new trading street, we'll discuss it in a month when it's finished. Okay. The twenty-five men said in unison. Asmodeus thought his ears might start bleeding. Well then, when should we make an unbreakable vow? Yes. Mr. Flamel will be the witness. So, half an hour later, Asmodeus returned downstairs to Grindelwald, and the Benisha family headed back to France to inform the elders of their actions. They would return to England in a couple of days and begin mass-producing magical weapons for incoming students. Spears, swords, staffs, axes, and so on. Chapter 34, Chapter 34, Problems and Their Solutions All right, for the time being, the issue with magical weapons is resolved. How are things progressing with the construction of the Elysium Academy? Inquired Asmodeus Grindelwald as he descended the stairs. The construction of the Academy is proceeding according to plan. In approximately three months, by the end of March, the exterior will be completed. The next steps involve designers and interior arrangements, replied Grindelwald. That's good. What about the new trading street? Asmodeus asked, noticing the darkened expressions on Gellert and the others. What's wrong? Any issues during construction? Asmodeus questioned, observing the visibly incorrect expressions on the elders' faces. Construction is proceeding smoothly, but, those shop owners in the Diagon Alley refuse to open branches with us. They claim there aren't enough wizards in England to attract visitors, explained Grindelwald. Hmm. Have you mentioned squibs to them? Asmodeus suggested. Yes, but they don't believe it. They won't believe there's a method for squibs to become wizards until someone officially announces it. As for muggles, we haven't disclosed that yet, admitted Grindelwald. All right, then let's announce through official channels that I've found a solution for squibs. A new magic academy will be built for them along with a trading street adjacent to the academy. Declared Asmodeus. Are you sure? I thought you wanted to quietly subjugate all squibs. Questioned Grindelwald. In fact, those filch brought me are already sufficient. I currently have 10,000 subordinates, former squibs, and I have no intention of handing over magical circle technology just like that. At least not until the academy admits all elite muggles and they become full-fledged wizards. I plan to announce through the Daily Prophet that I am ready to heal all squibs willing to sign a contract with the Morningstar family. They commit not to oppose the Morningstar family in any form. Sounds good to me, I'm all for it. All right, when can you make the announcement on behalf of the Minister of Magic? Tomorrow. Let the old man rest today, you know, lately, I've been constantly checking if everything is going according to plan during construction. All right. As Asmodeus said this, it seemed he remembered something and told Nicholas, who was descending the stairs, Nico, here, take this. Engrave these runes so that the castle and the surrounding area are always neither too hot nor too cold, he tossed the book to Nicholas. Basic runes for improving living conditions a book he bought a long time ago for 100 points. It contains special runes for enhancing comfort in the house and several runes for reinforcing the building itself. For example, the cooling rune can be used as an air conditioner if inscribed on the castle wall. In conjunction with the warmth rune, they can create a constant temperature of 25 degrees in the building. 
the book contains many such useful but non-combat applications of various runes. Wow, Asmodeus, this is excellent. I was thinking of using my alchemical knowledge for this, but with these runes, everything will be much easier. You're always welcome, Asmodeus nodded. By the way, Grindelwald, you can take this book from Nico and build a couple of high-class hotels on the trading street. I think there will be many visitors willing to pay extra for better living conditions. Moreover, Muggle elites will surely want to occasionally meet with their children there. You can register the hotels in your name, in any case, the entire street belongs to me. Oh, and regarding those who want to open branches with us after the Ministry of Magic announcement, suggest either renting the buildings we've constructed or inform them that building new structures is possible on the outskirts. Try to keep the shops in the center for our needs. Grindelwald nodded and said nothing. It didn't matter to him anymore, he was pleased that his goal was nearing completion, and he would assist Asmodeus in any way he could. Having said all he wanted to this group of people, Asmodeus headed towards where Newt's commander and mage zoologists were sitting. Newt, hello. How's the selection of animals I mentioned going? Oh, hello Asmodeus, I didn't notice you. What you asked for is not impossible, but still not that simple gathering different magical creature species below level 4 and creating habitats for them within the castle. I still don't understand why we're doing this. To allow Muggle students from different countries to interact with magical creatures from their regions and promote the protection of these beings. You know, according to our research with Bathilda babbling, the more wizards in the world and the more people know about magic and believe in it, the higher the magical density in space. Over time, the amount of mana in the world will only increase, and magical creatures will become more abundant, gradually becoming stronger. We need to train new wizards to interact with them in advance and not push them away. I know, I know. I just think it's better for animals to live in their natural environment. I completely agree with you, but we'll have to do this. I want to teach students to live in harmony with magical creatures and instill in them a love for nature. And for that, they need constant contact with friendly animals. All right, all right. I'll do it but I'll need a lot of funds. Ha ha ha, tell Nico to lend you the Philosopher's Stone if the money from the Muggles isn't enough. Anyway, he has boxes filled with those philosophical stones. I'm sure he'd be happy to lend you some. Newt's commander nodded. Having finished all his business, Asmodeus headed towards Dumbledore's table. Albus, tomorrow Grindelwald's people, in the form of fudge, will make a statement that I'm ready to cure squibs. You'll have to handle the pressure from the International Confederation of Wizards. Yes, I've already heard about it. Don't worry, I'm no longer the coward you could push around. I've broken out of the cage I trapped myself in after Fudge's ousting. Chapter 35, Chapter 35, Shock in the Magical World The next morning, the Ministry of Magic made a startling announcement. Squibs can become wizards. Worldwide newspapers. Daily Profit, Truth or Fiction the Ministry of Magic claims a Hogwarts student has created magic that can cure squibs and turn them into wizards. The Quibbler, Ministry of Magic News fudges attempt to divert attention from something more shocking. Wizarding World News, Will the World Have More Wizards? The Quidditch Weekly, Has Angus Buchanan's Dream Finally Come True? Spellbound, Are There Handsome Squibs Among Them? And so on. The entire magical world trembled. Letters flooded the Ministry of Magic from every continent, Squibs gathered at the entrance of the English Ministry of Magic. There were so many of them that each aura on duty had to cast the Obliviate spell at least 100 times a day. Soon, news came from the Ministry of Magic, Asmodeus Norin Morningstar, the inventor of the squib treatment method, will hold a press conference tomorrow at the Black Lake in Hogwarts. For conference passes, contact the Magical Law Enforcement Department of the Ministry of Magic of England. It is said that someone in the Ministry of Magic quietly shed tears, then angrily resigned from their job, considering the number of applications to attend the conference. Malfoy Manor, Wiltshire. Damn it. Lucius cursed, throwing the latest issue of the Daily Prophet to the ground. He nervously paced not because squibs could become wizards, in fact, it benefited him, as the Malfoy family also had squibs. His unease stemmed from Dumbledore not bothering to coordinate this conference with the Board of Governors, of which he was now the chairman. Previously, any event held at the castle required Dumbledore to inform the Board of Governors. However, this time, Dumbledore practically ignored them. You see, though Death Eaters fear Dumbledore, they fear not the Dumbledore who is the headmaster, but the one who fought against Voldemort. After the Dark Lord's fall, 
Dumbledore restrained himself and followed the rules set by the Ministry of Magic and the same Board of Governors. But lately, Dumbledore had clearly changed, he started meddling in Ministry affairs and actively participated in Wizengamot sessions. This scared the former Death Eaters. This attitude towards the Board of Governors made Malfoy realize that Dumbledore had altered his methods, and it remained uncertain whether he could be manipulated through pure blood influence within the Ministry of Magic. I should check this myself. Lucius muttered, wrote a letter, handed it to his owl, and, donning his coat, operat to Hogwarts. After some time, a group of pure blood wizards arrived at Dumbledore's office. The Hogwarts governors, led by Lucius Malfoy, collectively prepared to protest Dumbledore's behavior, allowing Asmodeus to hold a conference at Hogwarts without their permission. They should restrain Dumbledore before he starts ignoring the laws of the Ministry of Magic. What if he begins pursuing them outside the Ministry's jurisdiction? That's something they cannot tolerate. After Lucius Malfoy and others entered the headmaster's office, they were stunned to see Grindelwald there. However, they paid little attention, knowing that Grindelwald was free because of Dumbledore's guardianship. Ignoring Grindelwald, Lucius directly questioned Dumbledore behind the director's desk. Dumbledore. I think you owe us an explanation. Lucius Malfoy spoke first. Dumbledore looked at the threatening pureblood members of the family, smiled, and said, what happened? Upon hearing Dumbledore's words, Lucius smirked, enough joking, Dumbledore, we appointed you as the director. We have no objections to the conference, but you ignored the Board of Governors. If you can't give us a satisfactory answer, we might impose a ban on inappropriate activities at Hogwarts. Dumbledore remained silent, sitting and smiling. However, Grindelwald took the wand lying on the table and slammed it against the floor. Having lost his previous wand to his old lover, Grindelwald decided to align himself with the new wizards and ordered a coal-black combat staff made of obsidian, with dark blue crystals embedded at the staff's tip. The faint blue fiend fire enveloped the principal's office. Grindelwald provocatively stated, Oh! What explanation do you need from us? His magic instilled fear in everyone from the pure blood family, as he unleashed the advanced fierce fire curse without an incantation. Lucius and the others turned pale instantly. Feeling the heat of fiend fire, Goyle asked tremblingly, Dumbledore. Grindelwald. What do you think you are doing? Grindelwald, mocking, looked at the terrified Lucius and said, Are you still wizards? Grab your wands. If you can win, Dumbledore and I will listen to you. Lucius and the others were even more frightened. What kind of twisted joke was this? Engage in a duel with Dumbledore? Their masters dared not, especially considering Grindelwald was on par with Dumbledore in power. Just when Lucius and others were at a loss, Dumbledore stood up and patted Grindelwald on the shoulder. Grindelwald understood Dumbledore's signal and waved his staff to extinguish fiend fire. Lucius and the others breathed a sigh of relief, thinking that Dumbledore was still the restrained old man. However, Dumbledore's sharp gaze halted Lucius as he declared, Grindelwald means what I mean. Times are different now. Either raise your wands or get the hell out of Hogwarts. Dumbledore, no longer bound by worries of longevity, thanks to magical rings, confidently asserted he could live at least another 35 years, even without the elixir of life. Voldemort was dead, and a prophecy revealed resolution to all his regrets. The prophecy shown by Grindelwald about Asmodeus was something Dumbledore couldn't stop, giving him no reason to restrain himself. The board of governors turned pale, realizing the lion was no longer in the cage. Despite their unwillingness, Lucius and the others had no choice but to leave Hogwarts in despair. Dumbledore has lost his restraint. Lucius exclaimed angrily at home. Narcissa tried to calm him down, saying, Lucius, calm down first. After recounting the events at Hogwarts, Lucius calmed down a bit. Narcissa, concerned for their son Draco, asked about his safety. Dumbledore won't harm students, and Hogwarts is the safest place for Draco in the current situation. He'll be fine, Lucius reassured. Narcissa sighed in relief but the worry about their future lingered. With Voldemort gone, they were no longer protected. The recent disappearance of Lucius's dark mark indicated Voldemort's fall. While this seemed like good news, Dumbledore might now turn his attention towards them. Lucius was uncertain about what awaited him in the future. In reality, until the pureblood family opposes Asmodeus when he decides to announce about muggles, both Asmodeus and Dumbledore will remain indifferent to them. Asmodeus doesn't believe the Malfoys will object to his actions, especially considering the family's past closeness with muggles. The surname Malfoy originates from Old French, meaning treachery. 
Like many other forebears of noble English families, the wizard Armand Malfoy arrived in Britain with William the Conqueror during the Norman invasion. Providing magical services to William I, who became the King of England, Malfoy acquired the best parcel of land in Wiltshire, seized from local landlords, where his descendants have lived to this day. Their cunning ancestor, Armand, embodied many qualities that distinguish the Malfoy family to this day. Malfoys have always had a reputation, hinted at by their not-so-flattering name, as unscrupulous individuals seeking seductive power and wealth wherever they could find it. Despite their passion for pure blood status and firm belief in wizarding superiority, the Malfoys did not hesitate to flatter and curry favor with muggles when necessary. Consequently, they became one of the wealthiest wizarding families in Britain. Rumors suggest that over the centuries, the family successfully dealt with muggle currency and assets. Expanding their land holdings in Wiltshire, annexing the lands of muggle neighbors, and ingratiating themselves with royal authority, they added muggle treasures and artworks to their ever-expanding collection. Historically, the Malfoys maintained a sharp distinction between poor muggles and those with wealth and power. Before the introduction of the Statute of Secrecy in 1692, the Malfoy family mingled in noble muggle circles. They opposed this law, fearing a loss of their pleasant societal sphere. While subsequent generations vehemently deny this fact, some magical historians claim that the first Lucius Malfoy was a suitor to Queen Elizabeth I, although his attempts at marriage were unsuccessful. Nevertheless, some believe that Elizabeth I's subsequent resistance to marriage arose due to a Malfoy curse. Driven by the self-preservation that dictated the Malfoy's actions over centuries, after the enactment of the Statute of Secrecy, the family severed all ties with Muggles. They believed that continued protests would lead to alienation from the newly established Ministry of Magic. The Malfoys, making a sharp turn, actively supported the statute more fervently than its initial advocates, even denying any past interactions or marriages with Muggles. The immense wealth of the Malfoys ensured significant influence in the ministry for several generations, although no Malfoy sought the role of Minister for Magic. The family is often said to be absent from the scene of incidents, although their fingerprints might be on any wand involved in a crime. Independently wealthy and unburdened by the need to earn a living, they preferred the role of power brokers, concentrating real power in their hands, letting others undertake the greater, thankless work and bear the responsibility for failures. They financed many election campaigns for their privileged candidates, involving underhanded tactics to deal with opposition. The Malfoys treated all muggles who couldn't offer them wealth or power with genuine disdain. For most of their supporting wizards, this led to the doctrine of pure blood supremacy, seemingly the most suitable source of unhindered power in the early decades of the 20th century. With the introduction of the Statute of Secrecy, no Malfoy entered into marriage with muggles or muggle-borns. However, the family avoided the somewhat perilous practice of intermarrying with a small circle of pure-blood wizards, as such unions were considered weakened and imbalanced. Notably, there were a few half-blood branches regularly appearing in the Malfoy family tree. Considering all of the above, Asmodeus and his party do not believe that the Malfoys will oppose the repeal of the Statute of Secrecy and the transformation of muggles into wizards. Actually, if the Malfoys are given a broader field of action, they would gladly embrace it. Honestly, if one were to unveil the plan to Lucius about ushering muggles into the realm of magic, the Malfoys, as representatives of an ancient pure-blood lineage, would anticipate being granted a prominent role in this new order of things. Ah, how wrong they are going to be! The situation is exactly the opposite with families like Lestrange, Knott, Caro, etc., even though the heads of these families are in Azkaban, each pure-blood family has numerous side branches that still follow their orders. Asmodeus already has a solution to deal with the remnants of the Death Eaters. Chapter 36, Chapter 36, Press Conference Hogwarts, Black Lake, 12 o'clock. Students gathered around an improvised amphitheater, as the seating was reserved for journalists and representatives from the Ministry of Magic Worldwide. Hogwarts students would have to observe the conference standing, although they didn't mind. They still couldn't comprehend why their peer managed to create something that captured the world's attention. Asmodeus wasn't exactly inconspicuous at Hogwarts, quite the opposite. Thanks to the system and regular consumption of points for accelerated learning, his knowledge level was already comparable to professors, allowing him to assist in classes. Sometimes students witnessed heated debates between him and professors over matters they couldn't grasp. Lately, Asmodeus attended seventh-year students' classes, he frequently sat in ancient runes class, often disagreeing with the professor. Despite all this, it was hard for Hogwarts students to accept that while they were still learning summoning spells, their peer had developed something that would change the world. 
it's like attempting to get a driver's license on the third try while your childhood friend, with whom you played, just got a pilot's license over summer break. The levels are vastly different. Another reason why Asmodeus and his knowledge aren't widely known in Hogwarts is that he mostly interacts with six people and no other students. These are Cedric Diggory from Hufflepuff, Hermione Granger, Harry Potter, Cho Chong, and the Weasley twins. Moreover, he can communicate with the twins while ignoring their younger brother Ron. Due to this limited social circle, nobody paid much attention to this peculiar student, except for the senior class. They know exactly how many points this Ravenclaw earns for each lesson. Honestly, all seniors have long been convinced that Ravenclaw will win the Academy Cup this year. They just don't want to disappoint the juniors and keep on telling them that there's still hope for victory in the Academy Cup. The time approached for the beginning of the conference scheduled for 1300 hours. Journalists filled the seats, and Ministry of Magic representatives scanned the area for Asmodeus, who, by the way, hadn't shown up yet. As the scheduled time approached, someone in the crowd shouted, Look, on the tower. Everyone turned to see a figure with a staff in hand, seemingly preparing to jump. Professors, Professors. Someone call a professor, someone is about to jump from the tower. Before anyone could react, the figure jumped. Women and students closed their eyes, not wanting to witness the scene of a poor student falling. However, when gasps of surprise echoed around them, they reluctantly opened their eyes. Person held something like a hang glider behind his back, emitting flames from his feet towards the ground, extending the flight distance. Asmodeus had practiced extensively, calculating the maximum distance before the wings would catch fire. After a few seconds of stunned observation, journalists saw a platform forming in front of the approaching figure. This platform was perfect for landing, with a slightly raised angle allowing for an easy touchdown by extending the legs forward. Folding his staff and tapping it around him, Asmodeus conjured flames for a few seconds. When the flames disappeared, everyone saw a comfortable and, most importantly, elegant chair with a stand for the staff to the right of it. Asmodeus greeted everyone loudly and took a seat. Greetings to all present squibs, journalists, and envoys from various ministries of magic worldwide. Allow me to introduce myself, I am Asmodeus Norin Morningstar, creator of the so-called method of building magical rings, or, in other words, the savior of squibs. Feel free to ask any questions, I am ready to answer them. He said, settling into the chair. Before anyone could react, a witch in a bright green suit stood up and asked, you casually refer to yourself as the savior of squibs. Do you not consider the possibility of your method failing? What if someone, after your so-called treatment, cannot use magic? Seeing this attire, Asmodeus immediately understood that this audacious reporter, Rita Skeeter, would have been a special correspondent for the Daily Prophet without his intervention, sent to Hogwarts to cover the Triwizard Tournament. She is an unregistered animagus able to transform into a beetle, aiding her in acquiring hidden information. Honestly, he doesn't care about what she plans to write in her little newspaper, but he doesn't know how his former squib subordinates will react to her article. To be honest, he is very pleased with the individuals Filch introduced, they are loyal and have earned his trust. Each of them signed a very strict and inviolable vow, but none resisted or felt any negative emotions about it. All those introduced by Filch considered becoming direct subordinates of the Morning Star family in honor and found it natural for Asmodeus to request their loyalty in return for making them wizards. So, if someone dares to defame him in the newspaper, well, the newspaper may not last long. Forgetting his musings, Asmodeus responded to Rita Skeeter, Miss Skeeter, firstly, please raise your hand if you want to ask a question. We are civilized people and must behave appropriately. The second point is in response to your question. Yes, I am 100% certain that any squib can become a wizard after applying my method, and I believe calling myself the savior of squibs is still very modest. In fact, I will bring new blood to the magical world, which is currently too small. For example, Miss Skeeter, do you know how many squibs there are in England? Such a quick and prepared response baffled Rita, and the last question left her utterly speechless. Oh, you don't know? Too bad, you probably should take your job more seriously. So, I will tell you, in England, there are between 3,000 and 5,000 wizards and between 10,000 and 15,000 squibs. Moreover, most squibs don't know their squibs. Many of them have been living in muggle society for several generations but still remain squibs rather than becoming muggles. What sets them apart from muggles is that they have, albeit incomplete, a magical chain in their bodies through which magic flows in our organisms. 
My ring formation technique will allow squibs to restore their magical chains and perform magic. Hearing Asmodeus's response, people first restrained their laughter and then were in shock. No one had ever thought that there were so many squibs in England. What if we consider the entire magical world? If what this young man said is true, it would mean that the wizarding population would increase several times over. Naturally, this is good news for everyone present. All right, does anyone else have any questions? Ah, yes, the cultured gentleman on the right in the second row. Hello, Mr. Morningstar, I am from the French magical magazine Street of Magic. I would like to ask a question that concerns everyone, not just the English. How do you plan to spread your creation worldwide? Will you do it for free or for a fee? Are there any conditions for squibs who wish to become wizards? Chapter 37, Chapter 37, Press Conference Part 2 I am delighted that you've chosen to ask this question. Firstly, I've reached an agreement with the Ministry of Magic in England, allowing squibs from around the world to come to the Ministry of Magic in England, where I will welcome them. Over the next month, I will personally assist squibs in becoming wizards, and in the future, those squibs whom I've already cured will take on this responsibility. Secondly, yes, of course, this service will not be free. I request squibs to sign a magical contract in which they agree not to oppose me and my family in the future. But Mr. Morningstar, do you not find your demand somewhat threatening, as if you are planning something that might provoke opposition from the magical community? No, no, no. Actually, I am making these efforts solely to facilitate the progress of my future research and improve the lives of future generations of the Morningstar family, he said, winking at the French woman to the right of the journalist, who held a camera in her hands. His words caused many women to blush. Who wouldn't want their man to plan the future of their family in advance? Any other questions? Yes, you, the beauty in the third row on the left. Good afternoon, Mr. Morningstar. I represent the magazine Noticias Mysticas from Spain. You mentioned that after a month, squibs who have long become wizards will continue to help remaining squibs in your place. I'm curious about how long you've been researching your magical rings. As far as my information goes, you're only 14 years old and you've been at Hogwarts for just one year as a transfer student. Excellent question. I began studying the squib issue from the moment I entered Hogwarts. I saw that the magical world was too small, and I wanted to expand it. I viewed a group of squibs as the perfect focus for my research. As for my age, I believe geniuses sometimes emerge, Asmodeus said with a slight smile on his face. Upon hearing such a response, the entire hall applauded, except for Rita Skeeter whose quill scribbled, extremely arrogant, audacious and self-absorbed Mr. Morningstar. Too bad she doesn't know what awaits her upon returning home. Amidst the constant scribbling and chatter, the conference concluded after six hours. In the history of the New World, this conference would be remembered as a turning point, marking the beginning of visible changes in the world. Returning home, Rita Skeeter was furious, she hadn't been ignored and ridiculed like this in a long time. She decided to write an article that would spark widespread outrage. As she laid her notebook and quill on the table and began undressing, she was interrupted by a knock on the door. I'm coming. The sound of the door opening. Miss Skeeter, you are accused of illegal use and abuse of animagus. You will have to come with us for questioning. I, me, I, no, this is a mistake, how could I be an animagus? But no one listened. Grindelwald's followers who infiltrated the Ministry of Magic decided to preemptively rein in this journalist not by putting her in prison, but by making her work for Asmodeus and his company. For other journalists returning from the conference, their feelings were much more joyful. Everyone was impressed by Asmodeus's maturity and the level of knowledge he displayed at the conference. The next morning, various Magical World publications released news with massive circulation. Wizarding World News, Genius Student to Cure Squibs the wizard population will increase. What a wizard, I want to expand the magical world, quote from the Hogwarts student who cured squibs. Daily Prophet, Hogwarts student changed the world. Review of magical education in Europe, it seems Hogwarts will soon reclaim its leadership position among wizarding schools. Noticias Mysticas, important news, no more fireworks. Magical Street Talk, charming student who changed the world. The Quibbler, the phrase expand the magical world sounds like Grindelwald's slogan, perhaps there's a conspiracy behind turning squibs into wizards. And so on. Now officially confirming the news, squibs from around the world, not just England as before, headed to the Ministry of Magic in England. 
thanks to the flow network opened by various ministries of magic to directly contact the English Ministry of Magic, the magical world in England now had more people than the entire Eurasian continent. Over the next month, Asmodeus established himself in the ministry. He was assigned an office next to the Minister of Magic's office. In addition to the ceaseless thank you letters from Squibs, Asmodeus now had to deal with letters from various fans and business owners. For example, Good morning, Mr. Morningstar, I'm Stanley Shunpike, conductor of the night business we thank you on behalf of the entire night bus team, thanks to you, the bus is now packed every day, and we have the means to build a second bus. As a result, any member of the Morningstar family will now be serviced for free, just present the badge attached to this letter. If the Morningstar family expands, just let me know, and we'll allocate more passes for you. Thanks to you, we can now afford it. Or this. Good afternoon, Mr. Morningstar, I'm just a witch who fell in love with a squib. Thanks to you, my family is no longer against our marriage. Thank you so much. And so on. Asmodeus receives a couple of hundred such letters every day. After a month of work, he delegated the task of transforming squibs into wizards to subordinates who were once squibs themselves. He selected 70 individuals who would travel to different countries and transform squibs into wizards. Upon returning to Hogwarts, Professor McGonagall informed him that Dumbledore and Grindelwald were looking for him. Sigh, no rest for the weary, Asmodeus said wearily and headed to the headmaster's office. Chapter 38 Chapter 38, International Wizarding Federation While Asmodeus walked to the headmaster's office, more interesting things were happening in the Ministry of Magic. When Rita Skeeter woke up, she found herself tied up in a dark basement. Her mouth was sealed with a spell, and her body was bound with chains, rendering her immobile. A month ago, a group of Aurors suddenly burst into her home, accusing her of being an illegal animagus. On the way to the Ministry of Magic, she assessed the situation and decided to immediately use her animagus spell to escape. Transformed into a beetle, she intended to slip away unnoticed while the Aurors figured out where she had disappeared. After all, a beetle in the middle of the night wasn't the most conspicuous figure. But as soon as she shrank, she saw a wizard pull out a wand and use a type of magic she had never seen before. She intended to escape, but heard, there she is. Then, the beetle she transformed into was surrounded by a group of Aurors. The spell was cast directly on the beetle she turned into. It was the Cruciatus Curse, and at that moment, she realized that those present were not just Aurors but Dark Wizards. John Ryan, a subordinate of Grindelwald who commanded this operation, looked at the woman before him and said, Miss Skeeter, I advise you to be obedient, or should I curse you with my wand and ask you again? In the ministry, John relayed to Grindelwald that Rita Skeeter was bound in the Department of Mysteries. After reading the letter and casting a spell to conceal their conversation, Grindelwald smiled and said, John, how is our guest doing? John replied, Rita Skeeter hasn't suffered much. I think she'll be able to answer Lord Grindelwald's questions soberly. That's good. After finishing speaking, Grindelwald patted John on the shoulder and went to the prison. At this time, Rita's well-groomed hair was disheveled, and her body bore numerous wounds inflicted by dark magic. Rita saw Grindelwald entering her eyes filled with fear, and she hastily cried out, I'm ready to cooperate. Don't kill me. Please, stop torturing me. Grindelwald approached her and joked, is this the face of the first person in the Daily Prophet? Before Rita could continue speaking, Grindelwald pointed at her and said, you can live if you want. Sign an unbreakable vow with him and swear allegiance to the Morning Star family. I'm here as a witness. John, from now on, she will be your subordinate. Daily profit is ours from now on, said Grindelwald, quickly returning to Hogwarts. Underscore 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 Entering Dumbledore's office, the first thing Asmodeus heard was, Asmodeus, the International Wizarding Federation and the Wizengamot are planning to award you the Order of Merlin, first class. Asmodeus helplessly remarked, Do I have to attend? Or receive this award at all? It's essentially useless. Dumbledore responded, Certainly not. Merit in increasing the wizarding population deserves recognition, and the medal can only be awarded to you personally. Reluctantly nodding, Asmodeus asked, Isn't it possible to modify this ceremony to take place here? I don't want to travel across the realms for a useless trinket. Dumbledore, observing Asmodeus's uneasy expression, 
suddenly felt much better and said, that's not a problem. It has been decided to hold it at the Ministry of Magic in Britain. I will personally present you with the award. Seeing that he couldn't avoid it, Asmodeus could only nod and agree. It's not that he doesn't want recognition or something like that, it's just that the Order of Merlin has no actual influence in the world. It might help establish some connections, but Grindelwald and Dumbledore have already assisted him with that. Seeing Asmodeus in this state, Grindelwald smiled and said, Asmodeus, it's an honor that many people will never achieve in their lives. Asmodeus looked at Grindelwald and said, I just want to see how the Federation will react when I announce that the rings can make not only squibs but also muggles into wizards. Thinking about what Dumbledore had said, he got a headache. Although Asmodeus is responsible for research and the general direction of their actions, Dumbledore and Grindelwald have to intervene and prevent anyone from interfering. So, they get tired much more than Asmodeus. The presentation of Asmodeus's Order of Merlin, first class, was postponed at his insistence. After a month at the Ministry of Magic, these things seemed bothersome to him. Yesterday, he didn't sleep all day, and now he wanted to return to a relaxed state. So, Asmodeus left this matter to Dumbledore and Grindelwald. He intended to sneak back to his bedroom. Asmodeus is currently preoccupied with the affairs of the Saints and the takeover of the Ministry of Magic in England, while Dumbledore has meetings worldwide regarding Asmodeus's award. Due to this, the old man had to attend numerous meetings globally, including the Wizengamot and the International Confederation of Wizards. In short, Asmodeus is slightly worried about Albus's health, but there's nothing he can do about it right now he just wants to sleep. Asmodeus quietly returned to his bedroom and stayed there for two days, resting. After three days, he emerged from the room when Hermione called for him. In their daily lives, they get along well, and Asmodeus considers her a good friend nothing more, he's not a Lilicon pervert. He simply thinks that Hermione has changed a lot since that conversation in the bathroom. She no longer tries to please everyone and stand out. Currently, Hermione is more like a Ravenclaw than the one from the Golden Trio. She reads books that interest her rather than the entire school curriculum. She has almost stopped interacting with Harry and Ron, or rather, she doesn't interact with Ron at all, while she talks to Harry. Asmodeus has become a good friend to her, someone who can help if she doesn't understand something, and he introduced her to his circle of acquaintances, expanding her horizons. Those who are better than you won't consider you an upstart if you know something they don't, on the contrary, they will ask you for advice. Thus, Hermione joined this strange campaign of eagles, badgers, and lions. She often asks Cedric if she doesn't understand something about herbology and also talks to Cho Chong and Penelope Clearwater on female topics. Penelope didn't have to deal with Percy due to the arrival of Asmodeus. He noticed her because she performed very well in ancient runes classes and recommended her to Nico as a potential student. He was pleasantly surprised when he learned that Nico decided to teach her the crafting of magical instruments, seeing potential in her. Therefore, Penelope no longer needs to rely on her pure blood family to get a position in the Ministry of Magic. Oh, how surprised she was when she found out that Asmodeus and Nico knew each other. Now she regularly flirts with him. Asmodeus doesn't mind, but he is not yet ready to start a relationship. He believes it's better to contemplate this when his body completes the phase of rapid growth, especially considering that there won't be a long wait. Chapter 39, Chapter 39, Muggles Asmodeus, come out. We've all been waiting for you. Tell us about these so-called magical rings. Asmodeus was awakened by a knock on the door accompanied by a shout. I'm coming out now. Just wait five minutes. God, no rest, he thought. Five minutes later. Wow, you've all gathered here, Asmodeus said in surprise, looking at the people in front of his room. The Weasley twins, Cedric, Penelope, Hermione, and Cho Chong were present. Whose fault is it that you disappeared for a month? Ours. Hermione asked, clearly displeased. I was at the Ministry of Magic and I needed to control the situation until the former squibs will be ready to take further actions. All right, all right, no need to justify yourself. Better tell us why we didn't know that you were studying how to turn squibs into wizards. Fred and George asked. And would you have understood anything if I had told you? Asmodeus looked at them contemptuously. How would we know if we don't try? Well, if you want, you can also build magical rings on your hearts, Asmodeus said. What? All six exclaimed in unison. Why scream like that? I have a headache because of you. Do not deviate from the topic. 
What do you mean by asking us to build rings? Isn't it only for squibs? Huh? No, of course not. They are suitable for wizards with a functional chain as well. This way, you can increase your physical fitness and mana capacity, as Modius explained. Why didn't you say that earlier? They asked. You didn't ask. He replied. All right, all right, everyone calm down. Asmodeus, will you help us build the rings? Penelope asked. Yes, come in. I don't want to go anywhere, so let's do everything in my room. So, thirty minutes later, everyone had three rings each, with runes inscribed on their hearts. Don't forget, wizards don't need to adapt to magic, so they can build three rings around their hearts without worrying about overload. Try casting a spell, Asmodeus told them. The whole company nodded and began to try various non-destructive spells. Wingardium Leviosa Wow, it feels like before I had to concentrate when using magic, and now it's as if I can achieve the desired effect with just one thought, said Hermione, looking at the levitating teapot. In a sense, you are right, but currently, you are using too much magic for a basic spell. Magical rings are designed to enhance control over magic and increase the amount of mana in the body. However, this doesn't mean you should forget about control after gaining more mana. On the contrary, you must learn to spend less mana and better control magic. Additionally, thanks to the rings, your lifespan will increase, and your body will become stronger. Although you won't turn into a bodybuilder now, you will gradually become physically twice as strong as an average wizard. Hermione, thanks to the rings, your magic is now at the same level as Cedric's before the rings. And Cedric is now on PAR with elite auras in terms of mana. By the way, try not to tell anyone that rings can also be made for wizards. It will attract unnecessary attention and I don't need that right now. Coming from someone who is about to receive the Order of Merlin first class. You know, they usually give that posthumously, said Pinello. Asmodeus, are you cursing me? By the way, thanks for reminding me. I need to talk to you and Hermione, but that will be later. For now, Cedric, Fred, George, Hermione, Pinello, Cho, do you want to attend the Order of Merlin ceremony? Yes. The company answered in unison. Why are you all so loud, all right, I got it. You will receive invitations tomorrow. The ceremony will take place next week at the Ministry of Magic. You can bring your families. Now, all pure bloods, please leave the room. Why? Asked the Weasleys, Cedric, and Cho. Because I need to discuss something with Pinello and Hermione alone. Oh, why so secretive? You'll find out in a year, maybe two. Okay, okay, we're leaving. Good. After seeing off the four individuals, Asmodeus remained in the room with Pinello and Hermione. Hermione, Pinello, the next conversation must remain secret until I permit otherwise. Okay. Hermione nodded, and Pinello said, let's make an unbreakable vow. Even under legilimency, no one will know what we talked about today. Are you sure? Hermione, what about you? Yes. If this ensures keeping the secret, it's better to make an unbreakable vow. All right then. I'll make vows with both of you. You'll be a witness for her, and she'll be a witness for you. After a couple of minutes exchanging vows, Hermione asked, Okay, speak. I'm curious about the secrecy. You asked for it. What if I tell you I can turn your parents into wizards? What? It seems that I need a headache pill. Forget about your headache. What do you mean? What I said. I can make your parents wizards. How? Wait, really? Bingo, yes, I initially created the rings to allow muggles to become wizards. Oh my god, you want to repeal the statute of secrecy. SHH, my head hurts. And rightly so. You want to break the fundamental law of the magical world. Said Pinello. Calm down. Pinello, what do you think of the magical world now? Colorful? Unusual, strange, magical. Pinello replied. Asmodeus nodded and asked Hermione, and you? Pretty much the same as Pinello, just in my opinion, the magical world is also cruel. Asmodeus nodded and said, want to know what I think of the magical world today? Uh-huh, the two girls nodded. Poor, weak, outdated, crumbling, teetering on the edge, distant from complete destruction. Such a harsh description took the girl's breath away. You, isn't it a bit too? 
no. It's a clear description of the magical world. Especially when compared to the muggle world. Like muggle wizards, you should better understand what the magical world is facing. The power is not at all equal, and that's why I decided to absorb the muggle world. Let everyone in the world be a wizard. For the next two hours, Asmodeus explained to the two girls what he is currently working on. But what do our parents have to do with your plans? Isn't it better to wait until everyone becomes wizards, and our parents also fall under the category of everyone? To be honest, it's just my desire to give them a head start. You know, when everyone in the world becomes a wizard, many professions will disappear due to redundancy. So, in this way, I want to help you and your family secure good positions in the new world. So, have you decided? I agree. My father will be happy to become a wizard. Me too, I don't think anyone would be against it. Then it's settled. After my award ceremony, I'll meet with your parents and propose that they become wizards. Chapter 40, Chapter 40, Invitation After some time, the day of Asmodeus receiving the Order of Merlin approached. Hogwarts professors must be present, and Asmodeus also invited Hagrid, as he had good relations with Hermione. Asmodeus had already invited Hermione and Pinello, and they, in turn, invited their parents. Since their parents are muggles, everything related to wizards is very interesting to them. Hermione's parents, in their correspondence with her, expressed the desire to meet Asmodeus, about whom Hermione often writes. Grindelwald also planned to meet with Hermione and Pinello's families, as they are members of the most important group in their plan, muggle parents of wizard children and just muggles, not elite but average people outside the magical world. He wanted to understand their attitude towards the magical world and hear their thoughts on the possibility of becoming wizards. Asmodeus had already told Grindelwald about his actions a week ago. Wendell and Monica Granger, dentists with a daughter. But since a witch appeared in their own family, their worldview has completely changed. In this world, there is magic and wizards. And their daughter, Hermione Granger, is one of them. On that day, a witch in a dark green magical robe came to their house and demonstrated magic to them. Wendell and Monica saw as the witch waved the wand in her hand, and the cup on the table turned into an owl. This shocked them, prompting reflections on the peculiar occurrences around Hermione during their childhood. With Professor McGonagall's explanation, they understood it was the magical antics of a young wizard. Later, they descended into Diagon Alley, led by Professor McGonagall. The magical shop and enchanted items left them profoundly astonished and nostalgic. Hermione then attended a magical school called Hogwarts to study magic. Afterward, they frequently communicated with Hermione using Hogwarts Owl Post. The Grangers gradually gained a general understanding of the magical world through Hermione's letters. Hermione also gained her first friend, who introduced her to others his name is Asmodeus Morningstar. Initially, his surname puzzled them but they concluded that if magic exists in the world, then myths and legends from the wizarding world must have transferred from the magical to the non-magical realm, so they didn't dwell on it. The appearance of this friend was a relief for the Grangers, as Hermione had no friends in her early school years. They were concerned that their daughter might face bullying if she went to an unfamiliar place. Recently, in a letter, they learned that Hermione's new friend had actually received the highest honor in the magical world. Wendell was initially somewhat skeptical of this news. How could a child achieve something so outstanding to merit such a prestigious award? However, Hermione sent them a newspaper explaining why Asmodeus deserved this honor. In fact, lately, Hermione spends most of her time writing them letters about Asmodeus. This gave Wendell an indescribable premonition, but from Hermione's letter's description, he knew that Asmodeus regarded his daughter as a friend and nothing more. Wendell looked at his wife with a wry smile and asked, Monica, are we doing the right thing sending Hermione to Hogwarts? It seems like she's completely fixated on this boy. Monica rolled her eyes at Wendell and said, Now that it's a fact, don't worry about it. And read Hermione's letter, she is very happy now. I can't wait to see her new friends. After speaking, Monica took the letter from Wendell's hand the one from Hermione inviting them to Asmodeus award ceremony. Then Monica continued, She hasn't met anyone her age stronger than her. It might be good that she found someone who surpasses her, especially if it's a boy who interests her. Wendell said weakly, we should meet Asmodeus first. I don't know if this child is as powerful as Hermione described. The time soon came to the weekend, and the Grangers were fidgeting at home, waiting. Hermione mentioned that someone would come and take them to the investiture ceremony. Just when the Grangers couldn't wait, 
there was an explosion at the door, frightening the Granger couple. Before they could recover, they heard a knock on the door. Wendell hesitated for a moment, then quickly ran over to open the door. Opening it, he saw Hogwarts Professor Minerva McGonagall. McGonagall saw the Grangers, smiled, and said, Mr. and Mrs. Granger, it's a pleasure to see you again. The Grangers also hurriedly greeted McGonagall, Wendell said, I heard from Hermione that she was taken care of by you at school. Thank you very much. McGonagall shook her head with a smile and said, It's Hermione who works hard, and that's why professors cherish her in every possible way. She's a very clever little witch. Hearing Professor McGonagall's words, the Grangers raised their heads proudly. McGonagall then continued, Hermione should have told Mr. Granger about Mr. Morningstar. Today I'm going to pick up the two of you to go to Asmodeus Award Ceremony. As members of Hogwarts, we will enter the venue early. Hearing McGonagall's words, Wendell hurriedly asked, Professor McGonagall, please wait a moment. Could you start by telling us about this boy? McGonagall froze for a moment, then realized that Hermione was still telling her parents about Asmodeus a lot. McGonagall went on to say with great pride, Asmodeus Norrin Morningstar is the most talented wizard in the history of Hogwarts or in the history of magic. He is now the youngest member of the Order of Merlin. At the same time, he is a teacher's assistant for the subject of ancient runes. The Grangers completely believed Hermione's words after hearing McGonagall's explanation. Otherwise, who would have believed that a little wizard who was only eleven years old would have such an achievement? Wendell calmed down and asked McGonagall, Professor McGonagall, how do we get to the ceremony? The Grangers then saw McGonagall taking a napkin from her robe and say, This is called a portkea, and it is a tool used by wizards to travel. Hold on to the napkin, and I'll activate it on the count of three. Today's award ceremony took place in the Grand Hall of the British Department of the International Confederation of Wizards of the Ministry of Magic. By the way, Professor Dumbledore himself made this portkayette. Mrs. and Mrs. Granger looked very puzzled at the napkin. Is this what wizards use for travel? But the Grangers put their hands on the napkin after McGonagall said, closing the door behind her. Since they had witnessed magic, seeing the Grangers release their hands, McGonagall solemnly said, Absolutely do not let it go in the middle. Seeing the nervous Grangers nodding, McGonagall continued, Then I'll count to three. One, two, three. The Grangers saw the napkin trembling in their hands, emitting a faint blue light. Then the Grangers felt a hook in their navels. Then their feet left the ground. Their bodies started to fly forward swiftly, so fast that they couldn't see anything clearly ahead. The same thing was happening in the clear water home. Only this time, Professor Phileas Flitwick picked up Pinello's parents. Chapter 41, Chapter 41, Order of Merlin At the moment when the Grangers finally landed, they felt almost nauseous. Wendell struggled to get up from the ground and asked McGonagall, Professor McGonagall, is your wizard's travel, ugh? Has it always been this, thrilling? Monica was pale as well. Professor McGonagall looked at the awkward Granger couple, pulled two potion bottles from the wizard's robe handed them to the Granger couple, and said, Actually, portkea remains a more convenient method. The most common method we use is apparition. Mr. and Mrs. Granger, this potion will ease your symptoms. The Grangers took the potions, staring at the dark blue liquid inside, for a while, they dared not speak. Seeing this, McGonagall said, Just take a sip, and the effect will be quick. The Grangers finally mustered the courage and took sips of the potions. Cough, cough, cough. Wendell and Monica swore. They had never in their lives tasted anything so dreadful. It was like thick mucus mixed with the smell of raw fish. But they both found that after taking the potion, the discomfort soon disappeared. Monica said with lingering fear, Professor McGonagall, I don't think I'll ever forget this experience. Wendell also looked at Professor McGonagall and nodded. Professor McGonagall said with a smile, This is just the beginning, the rest is what you'll never forget. Only then did the Grangers have a chance to survey their surroundings. At that moment, they approached a red telephone booth in the alley, having no idea where the Ministry of Magic was. Afterward, McGonagall led them to the telephone booth in front of them. As soon as McGonagall finished speaking on the phone in the booth, three badges fell out of the coin slot. McGonagall instructed the Grangers to put on the badges. While they looked on skeptically, the space inside the booth began to descend slowly. Soon after, all three arrived in the Ministry of Magic's hall. Then, they needed to take the lift in the atrium to the British Department of the International Confederation of Wizards on the fifth underground floor. 
the award ceremony would take place there. Today, the fifth underground floor of the Ministry of Magic was exceptionally lively as the investiture ceremony of Asmodeus with the Order of Merlin, first class, was taking place. Reporters had arrived at the Ministry of Magic in advance to witness this bustling scene. Caitlin Ryan, a journalist from the USA, observed this lively scene and said to Rita Skeeter standing next to her, I didn't expect this. A Hogwarts student can indeed receive the Order of Merlin. And it's a first-class medal. Who would have thought of this before? Rita smiled and said, Of course. We are witnessing a legend this time. When Caitlin heard Rita's words, she looked at Rita in surprise and said, Miss Skeeter, don't you think it's a conspiracy this time? It's not easy to be sure about the topic. Rita ignored her co-workers, now filled with terror. She knew part of the truth. Everyone was a pawn that day. Now, even the Aurors of the Ministry of Magic were members of Grindelwald's party. She had also made an unbreakable oath, and now, as long as she dared to speak ill of the Morning Star and Grindelwald families in the newspaper, she would be killed by the oath. The Morning Star and Grindelwald families were now her big bosses, the kind that would kill her if she resigned. Now many people were under her arrangement, and there were more and more saints in another organization, whose name she didn't know, in the Daily Prophet. Sooner or later, Grindelwald, Morningstar and Dumbledore would control the discourse of the entire British wizarding community. More than that, she, Rita Skeeter, is the accomplice of the saints. Rita no longer knows what will happen to the world, the Grindelwald party is back, and in England, a genius appeared whom they support. Everyone in the wizarding world is wrong. Dumbledore is now all sided with Grindelwald. They work for the Morning Star Boy. They have a very big conspiracy, and they can even conquer the entire English Ministry of Magic. But she, Rita, couldn't speak out. She knew that if she dared to betray, what awaited her was something more painful than death. Ah! Rita sighed, just as she was about to go out for a smoke. The fireplace at the award ceremony is lit up. Asmodeus has arrived. Asmodeus had just arrived at the venue and seeing so many people, he rubbed his sore temples. Grindelwald beside him joked, Asmodeus, today is your debut day, cheer up. Asmodeus gave Grindelwald a dead fish glaze and said, If I could, I would refuse this useless nonsense you forced upon me. At this time, Hermione, Pinello, and Cho Chong were nervous as they had come to the Ministry of Magic with Asmodeus and were now standing near him. Asmodeus stepped in front of them first. At this moment, reporters quickly surrounded him. Mr. Morningstar. May I ask you about your next steps after receiving the award? Mr. Morningstar. Your Wizarding World expansion idea sounded like something from Grindelwald, are you going to continue the legacy of Gellert Grindelwald? Mr. Morningstar. What is your relationship with Gellert Grindelwald and Albus Dumbledore, they both came to support you today. Looking at the reporters who approached and the flashing lights of the cameras, he felt that his friends were getting nervous. Asmodeus got a little impatient and said, enough. As soon as Asmodeus's voice fell, two rows of red flames separated all the reporters from him and the people behind him. The reporters and the Ministry of Magic staff were frightened, backing away when they saw the fire. The rumors from Hogwarts that Asmodeus is really skilled in fire magic were confirmed. No spell, no wand, nothing. No one dared to say a word, looking fearfully at Asmodeus. This is the Ministry of Magic, and they are journalists. How can he boldly separate himself from them like this? At that moment, Grindelwald patted Asmodeus on the shoulder and said, Hey, I'll handle this for you, no need to be nervous. I'm not nervous, they just annoy me. Like persistent flies that won't go away. But you have to endure it. Asmodeus nodded, turned to the girls, told them not to get nervous, and walked ahead. When Asmodeus began to walk, the fire automatically dispersed in front of him, closing behind his group. Asmodeus's path and the group gradually diverged. The girls headed towards their families, and Asmodeus continued towards the podium. Among the reporters, Rita was the most frightened, it reminded her of the blue flames with which Grindelwald's subordinates intimidated her when they tortured her. On the other hand, the Granger couple, who had just arrived at the meeting place with McGonagall, also saw the scene where Asmodeus shoot away reporters. Wendell swallowed and asked McGonagall, Professor McGonagall, is that fire real? Is this guy really Asmodeus? Hermione said he's only 14 years old, but he looks like he's 16-17. He saw reporters converging on Asmodeus, but they were immediately repelled by the flames. It even frightened many people. McGonagall calmly said, Yes, 
he's Asmodeus Morningstar. He's a very talented wizard, but he can be aggressive at times. Regarding the fire, yes, it's real fire. I don't know if Hermione told you, but Asmodeus's magic has an element. This element is fire, so fire magic is like an instinct for him. Chapter 42, Chapter 42, Muggleborn Wizards While McGonagall patiently answered the Granger's questions, Hermione also approached them. Dad, Mom. Hello, sweetheart, how are you at school? Very well, my friends will be here soon. Oh, here they are. At this moment, the Grangers saw another group of people moving toward them. It was the Diggory family. Cedric, we're here. Hermione waved to them. Hello, Hermione. While Hermione and Cedric chatted, Mr. and Mrs. Diggory introduced themselves to the Grangers. Good day, I'm Amos Diggory, Cedric's father, and this is my wife, Lisa. Hello, it's a pleasure to meet you. We're very glad that Hermione has friends in the wizarding world. I think we should thank your daughter. Cedric says she regularly helps him with transfiguration assignments. Their conversation was interrupted by the Weasley twins, who greeted Hermione and Cedric. Hermione, Cedric, hi. Where are the others? They asked, slightly surprised. Cho Chong and her parents will be here a bit later, they wanted to bring her grandfather. Pinello and her parents were supposed to be picked up by Professor Flitwick, and here they are, said Cedric, seeing Professor Flitwick approaching with Pinello and a muggle behind her. Pinello's mother died when she was very young, and her father didn't know she was a witch until Pinello's acceptance to Hogwarts. Therefore, Pinello's father, who loved his wife very much, wanted his daughter to become a witch too. Hello, Minerva. Can I entrust Mr. Clearwater to your care? I saw representatives of the wizarding dueling community and want to talk to them. Thanks to Asmodeus and the glory he brought to the school, I'm sure I can convince them to hold this year's competitions at Hogwarts. Of course, Phileas, don't worry. I'll help Mr. Clearwater get home and assist him in understanding the magical world today, said McGonagall with a smile, looking at the eager Flitwick. Seeing Professor Flitwick leave, Mr. Granger asked McGonagall, Professor McGonagall, who is he? Professor Phileas Flitwick, teaches charms and is the head of Ravenclaw House, where, by the way, Asmodeus studies. People often underestimate him due to his peculiarities, but he's the best spellcaster among the living. He's a former world dueling champion with magical wands. Hearing this, the muggles nodded. Honestly, Flitwick initially seemed like a clumsy and kind old man due to his short stature. But upon hearing his titles, all parents understood that in the magical world, judging people by appearance wasn't wise. Pinello, where's Cho Chong? She's on the third floor of the ministry right now, said she would find us soon. After a couple of minutes, Jo joined them, accompanied by her mother, as her father and grandfather had business in another department of the ministry. Hermione's parents and Pinello's father regularly asked McGonagall about the magical world in Hogwarts. In turn, she patiently answered all their questions with a smile. Flying brooms aren't the only flying instrument for wizards. There are flying motorcycles and flying carpets. They're just prohibited from importing to England. Time flew during their conversation, and the award ceremony began. Mr. and Mrs. Granger, as well as Mr. Clearwater and the children, let's proceed to our seats, said McGonagall, leading the crowd like a mother duck guiding her ducklings. Watching Asmodeus take his seat, everyone from Hogwarts also settled in. Grindelwald sat next to the Hogwarts students. The poor kids and parents sank into their chairs. Only the Muggle parents didn't understand why their children were scared until they saw who sat beside them and heard the journalists' exclamations. Nicole Flamel. Nicole Flamel is present at the award ceremony. Who? Where? Oh, God, Nicole Flamel. Wait, who's beside Nicole? It's Grindelwald. Could the quibbler be right? Morningstar and Grindelwald planning something together. Oh my, this is big news. Flamel and Grindelwald sitting together. Doesn't Flamel hold a grudge against Grindelwald for attempting to burn Paris? Hearing the journalist's last exclamation, the Granger couple and Mr. Clearwater were in shock. What did they hear? The person beside them tried to burn Paris? Muggles moved away from Geller. Grindelwald. Nico chuckled, ha 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 ha. You're literally a terrorist just released from prison, sit quietly and don't scare people. Grindelwald While Nicholas Flamel taunted Grindelwald, the Muggle parents decided to ask their children who these two men were. 
Hermione, who are those men next to us? whispered Wendell. Gellert Grindelwald and Nicholas Flamel. I know, but what have they done, and why are they so famous? Oh, well, one of them initiated the first wizarding war and is considered somewhat of a magical Hitler who didn't attempt mass killings, and he's also one of the most powerful wizards of the century. The other has been alive for 600 years and was in charge of defending Paris during the war started by the first one. Upon hearing this casual response, the trio of Grangers and Clearwater lost their ability to speak. It seemed like they heard something unbelievable. Why did they hear something about 600 years? But most importantly, why are these people here today? And how can they be so friendly with each other? Before they could ask again, the door to the hall opened. Cornelius Fudge, the minister of the British Ministry of Magic, led the way, followed by teachers invited to participate in the ceremony. Also there were reporters who couldn't get inside earlier came last. Asmodeus spotted many familiar faces in the crowd. Bathilda Bagshot and Newt's commander smiled and nodded at Asmodeus. Asmodeus glanced at Fudge and said directly, There is no need to waste time. Can we start the ceremony? Fudge, with a smile on his face, nodded, he genuinely didn't care. He wasn't Fudge, and Lord Grindelwald had already declared that Asmodeus's orders should be regarded as important as his own. Minister Fudge obediently stepped onto the stage upon hearing Asmodeus's words. Welcome everyone to the award ceremony of the Order of Merlin. First class, for Sir Asmodeus Norin Morningstar. Today's honor for Mr. Morningstar will be presented by the Chief Wizard of the Wizengamot, Mr. Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore. The honor of Mr. Morningstar is the honor of the entire British wizarding community. Mr. Morningstar and Mr. Dumbledore, please come onto the stage. After Minister Fudge finished speaking, Asmodeus walked onto the stage accompanied by Dumbledore. Then, Minister Fudge took a copper box from under his robe and Dumbledore took the box, pulling out a green medallion from it. Dumbledore looked at Asmodeus, winked, and said, Congratulations. Saying this, Dumbledore attached the medal to Asmodeus's magical robe. The next moment, the hall erupted in enthusiastic applause. Everyone at Hogwarts cheered for Asmodeus. Asmodeus's friends stood up excitedly, happily watching him on stage. The saints led by John Ryan chanted Morningstar. To set the atmosphere. Comment. 9. Comment. Vote. Chapter 43, Chapter 43, Parents. After the award ceremony, John and the others returned to their posts. They still didn't have complete control over the Ministry of Magic. Now was not the time to let up. Gradually, those connected to Hogwarts also began to depart. Upon seeing this, the girls' parents wanted to bid a simpler farewell and accompany them to the fireplace network. However, as they started discussing it, they were interrupted by Penny and Hermione. Hermione, Mom, Dad, we need to wait for Asmodeus. He has something important to discuss with you. Penny, Dad, shall we wait for Asmodeus? I think you'll like what you hear. Parents. Nevertheless, they heeded their daughters and decided to wait for Asmodeus. After 15 minutes, they saw Asmodeus, who had just bid farewell to Newton. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Granger, Mr. Clearwater, Asmodeus nodded as he approached. I don't know if Hermione and Penny have told you why I wanted to talk to you. The parents shook their heads. Asmodeus threw a questioning look at Penny and Hermione. We didn't have the chance. Don't look at us like that, Penny said. The girls' parents observed their children's interaction, puzzled about what they were talking about. Well then, Mr. and Mrs. Granger's and Mr. Clearwater, I suggest we go to the Minister of Magic's office with me. I think he'll be happy to make room for a private conversation. Upon hearing this, the bystander, Fudge, nodded and said, If Mr. Morningstar needs a place to talk, your office is still vacant. Oh, then let's go to my old office. Um, Asmodeus, may I call you that? Yes, of course, Mr. Granger. All right, may I ask why you have an office in the Ministry of Magic? Before Asmodeus could answer, Penelope interjected, it's all because of muggles. He practically had to live here until most of England's muggles became wizards, so they assigned him an office. Okay, it doesn't matter. Let's go. In a couple of minutes, the group of six arrived at Asmodeus's former office. As I understand, the girls haven't told you why I wanted to talk to you. Let's not beat around the bush. I can and want to turn you into wizards. What? I want to turn you into wizards. Darling, 
did I hear correctly? It seemed like this little one is saying he'll turn us into wizards. No, dear, I heard the same thing. Mr. Clearwater, and you. Mr. Granger, you won't believe it, but I heard the same thing. Ha ha ha, 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 what a good joke, Mr. Clearwater. Asmodeus watched this farce with a twitch at the corner of his eye and finally decided to put an end to it. Mr. and Mrs. Grangers, as well as Mr. Clearwater, I wasn't joking, and you didn't miss here. I can turn you into wizards. Please take this information seriously. Upon hearing Asmodeus's words, the trio finally calmed down and adopted a serious expression. Asmodeus, although we are muggles, from our daughters, we clearly know that there's no one who can turn a muggle into a wizard. Please don't joke with us like this. Mr. Granger, do you know what I was awarded for today? For creating a method that allows squibs to use magic. Excellent. Do you know who squibs are? They are wizards who can't use magic, at least that's what Hermione told me. I don't know much about them. Let me explain. A squib is, in fact, just as much a wizard as Hermione, me, and Penelope. However, squibs have damaged magical conduits through which mana flows. As you understand, muggles simply lack magical conduits. But do you know how I restored the magical conduits of squibs? The girls' parents shook their heads. In essence, I built new magical conduits for squibs, which later merged with the old damaged sections. Wait, you said new magical conduits, does that mean? Yes, I can allow you to build what I call new magical conduits, or as I call my invention, magic rings. This will eventually allow you to become full-fledged wizards. It will take a maximum of three months if you follow the instructions. You're not joking. No, it's the plain truth. In fact, the entire elite of the Muggle Society underwent a similar transformation about seven months ago, and now I'm building a new magic academy for the wizards of the new generation. You, you want to make the whole world magical. Bingo, Mr. Granger. You're right, I don't want to see magic disappear from the world. Then why do you need us? Uh, I just decided to give my friend's parents a head start. All right. I agree, intervened Monica. Dear, you. Wendell, I don't understand what there is to contemplate. We can get closer to our daughter, so why refuse? I agree too. Mr. Clearwater said. Okay, you're right. I'm ready too. Especially since Asmodeus's words make it clear that the world is about to change. Good, I'm very glad that you made the decision so quickly. Half an hour later, the Grangers and Mr. Clearwater headed home accompanied by Professor McGonagall, each with a magic ring and runes engraved on their hearts. Asmodeus returned to Hogwarts with the girls. Chapter 44, Clarification About Magic and Fire Bending Guys, everyone who writes about fire bending not being magic. I know. Don't you realize I'm not comfortable separating the two? That's why I defined fire bending as magic. My god, why do I have to explain this? Fanfic doesn't have to be accurate in that sense especially since I'm merging several worlds together. In my setting fire bending and the rest of the elements is just a special bloodline given to humans by the lion turtle. In my story, mana slash chi and all kinds of energy that can affect reality have one root. Cosmic energy. It's just that everyone has learned to apply it differently. This will be explained in future chapters. So the protagonist can use magic, and any bender can use it. Please calm down about this. If you think my approach is wrong please go read the original book and enjoy. No one is forcibly holding you down or forcing you to read it. To all those who like the book thank you so much for your support, updates are about to resume. I had a vacation from everything and decided to take a week or two to drive around Europe. If you want I can post a couple of pics in Patreon if anyone is interested. No charge. Chapter 45, Chapter 44, Otto, I am back. With the burgeoning magical population, the proprietors of potion shops, material emporiums, clothing stores, and more found newfound interest in a new trading street built by Asmodeus and his company. Upon returning to Hogwarts, Asmodeus unwound, while Grindelwald and Asmodeus subordinates diligently negotiated leases and construction permits. Asmodeus personally granted construction permits, as the land on which the trading street stood was now registered under the Morningstar family name. Gradually, the Omnis Trading Street, translating to everything in Latin, came to life. Some wizards even sought permission to build houses on the outskirts, prompting construction crews to create new branches, 
expanding this nascent village. Currently, Hogsmeade's population stands at around 500, while around the trading street, no fewer than 2,000 have settled nearly half of the English magical world, before squib magification, of course. Recognizing the village's potential and future development, Asmodeus decided to give it an official name. Thus, the world witnessed the emergence of the largest magical village Adastra or leading to the stars. By the way, until the academy's construction is complete, Asmodeus opted to maintain bewilderment spells and concealment charms at the construction site. He believed it better to gift the magical world with more surprises. Therefore, for now, those living in Adastra remain unaware that they will soon reside near the world's largest magic academy. Otto Nelson, a 25-year-old young man, is simply one of the squibs living in the muggle world, unaware or, more accurately, not comprehending that he is a squib. His father is a wizard from the USA, and his mother, a muggle, pursued the American dream and moved to USA with his father. When it was revealed that he was a squib, his father distanced himself from Otto and his mother. To avoid starvation, Otto's mother took him and left the USA, heading to Germany, her parents' homeland. His mother returned to her elderly parents, unable to work due to their care needs. Formerly a caregiver, she took on the responsibility herself to avoid spending money on one. At 14, Otto found a job as a janitor in the muggle world. Life gradually improved, and after a couple of years, Otto became a waiter and assistant manager at the cafe. He saved up, but recently had to spend on his grandfather's funeral, who had become a surrogate father after Otto's own abandoned them. Unfortunately, his grandfather was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer, opting not to endure the treatment for a few extra months of life. Several more years passed, Otto, now 22, managed the cafe and developed a relationship with the owner's daughter, possibly heading towards marriage. Otto wasn't ambitious, he genuinely liked Anna and wanted to marry her with her father's blessing. Young love evolved into a strong relationship, leading to marriage a year later. At 24, managing his wife's cafe, Otto enjoyed financial stability. His thoughts turned to the past, questioning why his father abandoned them and what being a squib meant. Amid such reflections, Otto, now 25, happily married to Anna, contemplated a bright future. It's just a pity that the brighter the light at the end of the tunnel, the darker the darkness behind him. Lately Otto had been thinking more and more about his childhood. One day, while strolling through Europa Park in the town of Rust, Otto and Anna encountered a man holding a sign, Squibs, only you can see this, come to me if you want to become wizards. Seeing the sign, Otto was plunged back into memories from a decade ago. Darling, what's wrong? Why were you angry with little Otto? Step aside, Maria. He's not worthy of your protection. He's a squib. What squib? You've lost your mind, Mark. He's your son. I don't have a squib for a son. Shouldn't have gotten involved with a muggle, parents were right, your blood is dirty, and I should have married a witch. This dialogue was etched into Otto's memory, not that he wanted to remember it, it just imprinted itself on him. Lost in these reflections, he didn't notice the man with the poster approaching. Good morning, sir. Said the man in German with intermittent breaths as he ran towards them. Uh, good morning. Otto replied in confusion, holding his wife's hand. Oh, my goodness, how did you do that? Anna exclaimed after touching Otto's hand. What's wrong, dear? This man, he just had a sign with directions to buy tickets for rides, but as soon as you took my hand, the poster changed. Hey? Really? I thought it always said something about squibs. No, I'm sure. Their conversation was interrupted by the man with the poster. Um, may I explain? Otto and Anna turned to him with questioning expressions. Mister, you're a squib. I used to be one too, but now I'm a wizard. Otto, darling, let's go, don't interfere with this lunatic. Saying that, he turned and started walking away from the man with the poster. Service for squib identification employee, do I sense disdain? Wait, sir, please, it's true. I don't know why you're unaware of wizards, but I think you should hear me out. It could change your life. Otto didn't stop, but suddenly he felt Anna pulling his hand. Dear, let's hear him out. I think you heard the word squib a year ago, in a dream, you mumbled something, and squib was one of the words. Otto was perplexed. He didn't want to remember his childhood and thought that after that incident a couple of years ago, he wouldn't recall it again. But subconsciously, 
he said something in his sleep. Fine, we'll hear him out. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Nelsons. Mr. and Mrs. Nelson. Please follow me. There's a cafe nearby. They brew excellent coffee, don't worry, it's on the house. Actually, it's one of our spots in Germany. All right, let's go. In a couple of minutes, this newly formed group reached the cafe. But Otto found the cafe very strange. Half of the cafe was no different from similar ones in the amusement park, and there was even a small queue. But Mr. Faustino, as he introduced himself on the way, didn't stop at the line. He walked past the main entrance and turned the corner, leading them to a quieter street. He tapped the cafe wall with a wand about 30 centimeters long, and a door appeared in the wall. Anna and Otto, after this, already believed a little in his story about being a wizard, but not enough to be fully convinced. Passing through the door, the Nelson couple saw a huge hall where many people sat in strange cloaks, talking about something. The roof was dome-shaped, and the room had the shape of a hexagram. There were different stalls and cafes around, seemingly surrounding huge gates from floor to ceiling standing right in the middle of the hall. Inside the gates, from bottom to top, a green fire burned, from a distance it looked as if the gates were covered with a green swirling film. It looked mysterious and magical. On the sides of the gates were scoreboards displaying the time and names of cities. 1240, London, Hogshead Inn. 1310, Paris, Lunar Vampire. 1350, Madrid, Night of Dance. 1415, Rome, Gladiator. 1450, Athens, Thoughts of Aristotle. 1510, London, Ministry of Magic. 1540, Berlin, Ministry of Magic. And so on. There were hundreds of cities and some strange names. Oh, Mr. Nelson, are you interested in flu network gates? Yes, yes, Mr. Morningstar came up with a brilliant idea. Enlarge the fireplace and make it in the form of gates. At a certain time, the gates lead to the place indicated on the scoreboard, and when it's time for another destination, it changes. Just don't try to jump in at the last minute. No one is sure where you'll end up, believe me. I had to spend half a day in Athens just to wait for a new flight, and I needed to be in England. Otto and Anna listened, not understanding what he was talking about. Oh, sorry, I forgot that you're not wizards. Well, not yet. Okay, I'm getting tired of this. Explain to me where we are and what this place is, Otto said a little impatiently. Yes, 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 oh, come, there's a spot in the corner. They sat at a table in a cafe named T. Joe and from this spot, they could survey the entire hall. Well, Otto impatiently asked. Allow me to introduce myself once again. My name is Ray Faustino, and I am a wizard, proudly stated the man. Mr. Nelson, what do you know about your parents? My mother is a simple woman, and my father is a piece of trash who abandoned us. I'm sorry, I didn't know. But I think I know the reason. Have you heard the word squib before? Yes in my childhood. It was because of that word that my mother and father had a falling out. Finally, explain to me what it means. Otto said, displeased. He didn't want to recall the past, and this man kept asking about it. Calm down, dear, Anna gently said. She knew Otto didn't want to remember his father leaving, but seeing this place, she thought that what Mr. Faustino would tell might help her husband finally let go of past grievances. Thank you, Mrs. Nelson. Mr. Nelson, as you can see, we're not in an ordinary place right now. But instead of explaining, I think it's better to show you practically. Saying this, the man pulled out a wand and tapped it on his coffee cup. With expressions of shock on Otto and Anna's faces, they saw the cup transform into an owl that perched on the man's shoulder. You, is this? How is this possible? This is magic, Mrs. Nelson. And your husband can master it too. Said the man proudly. You know, just a year ago, he was the same, a squib living in the wizarding world, seeing magic but unable to use it. But people from the Squib Support Society found him and brought him to Mr. Morningstar, who gave him a second chance at life. All right, now I believe in magic. But what is a squib? A squib is a child or descendant of a wizard who cannot use magic. You are such a person. Honestly, we would have come to you earlier but the squib detector can only find those squibs whose magical chain is damaged by no more than half. Your magical chain seems to be severely damaged, making it difficult for the radar to detect you. 
the squib detector operates based on a magic density meter developed by Asmodeus. Squibs cannot use magic, but their bodies still contain some magic in their magical chains, making them easy to find. The more damaged a squib's magical chain, the harder it is to locate them. So you're saying my father abandoned me and my mother just because I can't use magic? Otto said with extreme bitterness. I'm sorry, Mr. Nelson, but that's the case. You were born during a time when the purity theory was at its peak, and squibs were considered lower beings in the wizarding world, even below house elves. Of course, that was before the invention of magical rings by our savior, Mr. Morningstar. Now, squibs are equal to wizards, and there's no difference between us. But this is cruel, Anna said sadly, looking at her husband who was holding back tears. I know, Mrs. Nelson, but unfortunately, the magical world was like that before. Okay, let's forget about it. What did you mean when you said you could make me a wizard, and why are squibs equal to wizards now? In short, a year ago, Mr. Asmodeus Norin Morningstar created a method through which squibs can restore damage to their magical chain and become wizards. It's the greatest invention in the history of magic. All right, but what do I need to pay for this? Otto asked somewhat suspiciously. After five years in a managerial position, he knew that there's no such thing as a free lunch. Nothing. You just need to sign a magical contract in which you agree not to interfere with the further actions of the Morningstar family. And that's it. Or does your Morningstar family plan to destroy the world? Why only one condition, and such an unclear one? Haha, <laughs> you're joking amusingly. Actually, every squib asks this question, but Mr. Morningstar said it's to facilitate his further research and the promotion of products from his future studies. Besides, what can one family do? You're probably right. What do you think, Anna? Otto asked his wife. He wanted to know her decision on this matter. He didn't want to make such an important decision without her, she gave him the love he had been missing. What's there to think about? Of course, agree, and with magic, you'll be able to help me in the kitchen at home. Am I right, Mr. Faustino? Ha ha ha, yes, indeed. At home, you can do whatever you want. The new laws allow displaying magic to your relatives. Besides, there are separate books on home magic and cooking magic. I think you'll be thrilled if your husband can tidy up the house with a wave of his wand. Upon hearing this, Anna's eyes sparkled. After all, who wouldn't want someone to handle household chores? Otto, agree immediately, and tonight, a surprise awaits you. Otto nodded without hesitation and said, Mr. Faustino, where do I sign? Here's the contract. Read it. I'll answer any questions you may have, he said, handing the crumpled A4 sheet to the Nelson family. So, after five minutes, Anna and Otto thoroughly scrutinized the contract from A to Z, not skipping a single letter. The surname Morningstar. But they found nothing that could raise suspicion. In fact, there were only five points in the contract, all of which essentially meant one thing, not to oppose the Morningstar family. And that was it, no more conditions. After signing the contract, a vague symbol sparkled on Otto's hand, and he quickly disappeared. It was a sign of a successful, unbreakable vow. Well? When will I become a wizard? Otto asked him patiently. He wanted to return home with Anna as soon as possible, you know how German women can surprise you. Just a second, Faustino said, taking out his wand and aiming it at the contract. Contractum firium antum. The contract lit up and vanished, replaced by a pouch of golden galleons. What did you expect? He had to earn a living somehow, and he received 200 galleons for each squib he returned to the magical world. These were the funds Asmodeus paid his subordinates. Money meant nothing to him, but attracting new people to the magical world played into his hands. Therefore, the profession of squib detective became one of the highest paying in the magical world. Until all muggles become wizards, this method of increasing the population is extremely effective. Moreover, it creates job opportunities for newcomers in the magical world, allowing them to earn a living. Everyone benefits. Here, take this, Faustino said, pulling out a brochure with the methodology for building magical rings and a pouch of money. These funds, financed by magic ministries in different countries, are given to new squibs. There are 100 galleons in there, which will allow a squib to buy everything they need for the first time. In any case, they will quickly recover their money, as 80 galleons equate to the average monthly salary in the Ministry of Magic. And new residents in the magical world mean more consumption, 
more consumption means more production, and so on. In this brochure, it says what you need to do. If you want, I can help you form magical rings right now. Don't worry, it's free. I've already been paid for my work. Before Otto could say anything, Anna said, Yes, right now. Make him a wizard. Otto smiled wryly and nodded to Faustino. After ten minutes of continuous magical ring construction, Otto finally restored his magical chain. Merlin's gray beard. Your magical chain was damaged by 80%. No wonder the radar couldn't detect you, but now it doesn't matter. The main thing is that you're a wizard now. First, you should buy a wand. You can get one here in Germany from Gregorovich or go to England to Olivander. Since you're American, you can also go to the USA, but I don't recommend it. I can proudly say that wand makers in Europe are recognized as the best in the world. Olivander in England is silently considered the best in Europe since the most powerful wizard in the world bought his wand from him. To get to England, do I have to use this thing? Otto asked, pointing to the gate. Yes, it's the Morningstar family's teleportation network. They signed a contract with the family that manufactures flu networks, and now it looks like this. Much more convenient than a fireplace. Also, since it's the European transportation system, if you don't plan to stay in another country for more than a week, you don't need to register with the local Ministry of Magic. If orders stop you, just show them the ticket. It costs one galleon one way. Don't think it's cheap. It's cheap only because the Morningstar family covers 90% of the cost to encourage tourism in the magical world. Otherwise, the ticket would cost no less than 10 galleons. In the pouch I gave you, there are 100 galleons. Besides, let me tell you a secret. You can exchange money for gold in the Muggle world and then exchange gold for galleons in the Wizarding Bank. It's much more profitable than exchanging directly. So, have you decided to buy a wand here or in England? In England, since you say they're the best in Europe, and I don't want to return to the US ever again. Then, you can check the board to see when the gateway to England will open tomorrow. Look for the destination Diagon Alley or the Shopping Street Omnis. There are branches of Ollivander's shop in both places. In the store on Omnis Trading Street, you can find a guide, give him a couple of sickles, and he'll guide you. Honestly, it's grown so much lately that it's hard not to get lost. Why tomorrow? Can't it be today? Anna asked, eager for her husband to learn cleaning magic quickly. Haha, it's already 7.18pm, and the last gate to England closes at 7.20pm. Remember what I told you. Don't try to jump in at the last minute. Yes. Look. There's a fool running there who wants to take a risk. I bet he'll end up not in England but in Denmark, Faustino said, pointing to a person running towards the gate and then to the board, which changed right after he jumped into the flames. The destination Diagon Alley changed to Copenhagen, Ministry of Magic. See? Some wizard scientists already think that the board is behind the portal because even if you manage to jump in within a minute, you'll still end up somewhere else. Um, why not fix this problem or... I don't know, stop people who want to jump in at the last moment. Anna asked, bewildered. Hey, why? It's fun. Later, in the bar, everyone listens to someone wandering around the country looking for something to do until the returning gate. I see. Anna said, not understanding the humor of wizards. Okay, let's go home today, and tomorrow we'll come back here. Look, see there? Tomorrow at 12.40 the gate to Omnis Trading Street will open. We'll stroll there and then return on the last flight, Otto said, hoping that Anna wouldn't decide to go to Berlin. Right now, he wants to return home a and Well, you understand. All right, let's go home, Anna said flirtatiously. So, bidding farewell to Faustino, Otto returned to the parking lot and drove home with Anna. She promised to do things the way he likes when they return so the unfortunate three-liter diesel engine felt unprecedented loads on the Autobahn. Fortunately, on most German highways, there are no speed limits. Chapter 45, Magic Tourism After an unforgettable night playing the roles of an evil sorcerer and a trusting young girl, Otto and Anna returned to the amusement park. However, approaching the wall, Otto and Anna were at a loss how could they get inside? They hadn't had a chance to buy wands. But within moments, the brick wall dissolved again, and a door appeared before them. Strangely, a voice echoed seemingly from nowhere. Come in, I see you. To your right, the wall isn't brick but transparent, just an illusion spell. 
I watched Ray bring you here yesterday, so I'll let you in. Otto and Anna nodded synchronously and entered. Inside the building, to the right of the door, they saw an elderly but cheerful woman sitting behind a marble black table in the corner with a sign that read Ticket Counter. Yesterday, they hadn't noticed her because they immediately followed Faustino. I'm Miranda, the concierge of this transportation network branch. If you're not heading to the bar but want to go somewhere, you'll need to buy tickets from me. I also allow those who forgot which brick to touch. In rare cases like yours, I have to deal with those who don't have wands yet or those who don't use them at all, like you Agadu School of Magic graduates. Um, thank you. You're welcome. So, are you buying tickets? Or are you heading to the bar? The cashier asked. We need tickets to England, to, what arrival points are available there? Oh, England. There's a lot of good stuff there Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, one of the oldest wizarding shopping streets in the world Diagon Alley, and the village of Hogsmeade near Hogwarts. But I understand you used to be a squib. Yes, I used to be a squib. Then I suggest you head to Omnis, the shopping street in Adastra village. It was built recently but has already become a point with the largest permanent wizarding population in the world. There are no fewer than 2,000 wizards living there permanently, and from Germany alone, at least 100 people travel there every day. And according to official data from all of Europe, no fewer than 900 people visit it daily. So, where do you decide to go? To Omnis, the shopping street. Please, two tickets. Haha, <laughs> I knew it. Except for those old folks who don't accept anything new, most people will choose the new Omnis. Do you want round-trip tickets, or one-way? What do you think? Otto asked Anna. Hmm, we've never been to England, so maybe we should explore there a bit longer. Before Otto could answer, Miranda decided to ask, Guys, how much are you willing to spend there? You need money to buy all the necessary wizarding supplies, as the Morning Star family sponsors squibs, but to stay in England, you'll need money. Of course, if you're planning to stay at the Leaky Cauldron pub, forget about my question, but... I don't want to badmouth old Tom, but he should clean up his hotel more often. Money is not a concern, I brought some gold with me. Ah, so Faustino told you. It's an interesting loophole, but yes, if you have gold, the goblins will treat you like royalty. Well, in that case, I recommend you stay in a double room at the Hogshead Inn. Although now it's hard to call it a pub, it's more like a five-star hotel in the wizarding world. They have excellent rooms for the price of five galleons per night. I know it might sound steep, but it's worth it. They host conferences and gatherings for wizarding researchers from around the world. Recently, for example, there was a gathering of potion makers, although it ended with Professor Severus Snape of Hogwarts throwing a vial of potion at someone who disagreed with him. But most of the time, it's very quiet there. Although the Hogshead Inn is not located in Adastra Village, it's on the outskirts of Hogsmeade Village, close to Hogwarts, and 5 kilometers from Adastra Village so if needed, you can rent a flying carpet and reach there. Although, if you're willing to spend an extra 2 galleons, you can use the portal just like here, but I don't recommend it. 2 galleons for a trip to another country is not expensive, even cheap, but 2 galleons for 5 kilometers, excuse me, but that's robbery in broad daylight. For a flying carpet, you'll pay a maximum of 20 sickles, much cheaper, and you'll get to see the landscapes. By the way, the Hogshead Inn Hotel slash pub is owned by Albus Dumbledore's brother, Aberforth Dumbledore. If you don't know who Dumbledore is, ask someone in England, they'll be happy to tell you. Honestly, before Asmodeus Norrin Morningstar appeared, he was the main figurehead of their wizarding community. Moreover, he is considered the most powerful wizard in the world today. Although no one knows how powerful Mr. Morningstar is, but most think he's still too young, even though there are reports that he burned a troll to ashes with a simple fire spell. But officially, Dumbledore is the strongest. Therefore, no one dares to cause trouble there. Otto and Anna quickly realized that this elderly lady loved to talk, but then she provided such a large amount of information that they felt a bit overwhelmed. Nevertheless, Otto decided to learn in advance about the magical world of England to make the most of their time there. Besides, he checked on the display board, and there's still a whole hour and a half until the nearest portal to the Hogshead Inn opens, so there's no need to rush. Mrs. Miranda, could you tell us what else we can do in England so that we know in advance how long we should book a room at the hotel? With pleasure. You know, before becoming a witch, I worked for 40 years in a travel agency. 
that's why I chose this profession. So, after you settle in the Hogshead Inn, ask the locals where the parking for flying carpet drivers is, it's something like muggle taxis. Until recently, they were prohibited in England, as the Ministry of Magic called them unsafe. In reality, they just didn't want flying brooms to take a back seat because carpets are produced in the Middle East, and it's an import. Oh, I got distracted. Find a flying carpet driver and tell him to take you to Omnis Trading Street or Adastra Village, depending on what you want to do first buy a wand or enjoy the views. But first, ask about the price. That's crucial. Don't get in if it's more than 25 sickles, it's expensive. Negotiate and lower the price. They like to take advantage of tourists. If you still choose to buy a wand first, which I recommend, head to the center of the trading street. There will be a little shop that is called Olawinder's, Omnis Branch. Run by the daughter of the world's most famous wand maker, Olivander. By the way, they have another store, but it's in Diagon Alley, with the same name, it just says they've been making wands since 382 BCE. Honestly, I don't believe it, but who knows. I've only been in the magical world for 1.5 years and don't know its history that well. After you buy a wand it will cost at least 30 galleons, if you were a child entering the wizarding school, it would cost 7, but you're older, and you were given the money for that you can go for a stroll and look at books on magic. By the way, since you're a former squib, you can enroll in magic courses starting next spring. I don't know where they will be held. I only know that Asmodeus Morningstar is building something like a magic school for muggles and their children. Just no one knows where it is. After buying a wand and books, you can go buy yourself a wizard's robe, but honestly, they've started going out of fashion. Most wizards saw how former muggles dress and started to refuse this style. Oh, if you're interested in potion making, you can buy yourself a cauldron. It's better to buy a used one, in any case, if you're learning potion making, it will explode more than once. With the rest of your purchases, you'll figure it out on your own. Check how much you spend on books, etc. Then, you should head to the village for a walk. Adastra, though a small village compared to Muggle cities, is very beautiful. In the evening, you can stroll down the street of magical lanterns, which are actually magical creatures flying near the magical plants store. They beautifully illuminate the street, and in the evenings, couples love to spend time there. Then you can return to the Hogshead Inn, A and D. Ah, is today Saturday. Otto and Anna nodded, they didn't even speak, just confirmed. What did you expect from them? They saw a person who could talk without stopping for the first time, it seemed to them that she didn't even breathe, just spoke non-stop. Oh, since it's already Saturday, you're in luck. At the registration desk, you can buy tickets for a tour around the Hogwarts area. You know, it's the first wizarding school in the world, and it's rich in history. Although they won't let you inside the castle because there are many students, they'll let you walk in the inner courtyard, and you can row on the Black Lake in a boat. If you're lucky, you'll see a beautiful sunset. Oh, don't be afraid of the guide who will show you around Hogwarts. Although it's an open secret, he's a half-giant. Don't fear him, he's just a very large and tall wizard. By the way, for an additional fee, at night, you can go with him into the Forbidden Forest and watch the moon dance of the moon calves living there. It's on the outskirts of the forest, so don't worry it's safe there. Besides, you'll be accompanied by a group of five adult wizards. By the way, so you know, until recently, besides students, no one could enter Hogwarts and its territory without special permission. But Headmaster Dumbledore decided that to support tourism and better acquaint former squibs with the magical world, he would open the entrance to Hogwarts every second Saturday of the month. Although I think he just wants to earn extra money before his retirement. Oh, there are only 15 minutes left. Come on, guys, quickly, two tickets there and back or just one way. Anna and Otto, still somewhat stunned by Miranda's continuous speech, didn't initially understand why she abruptly stopped. But then they realized. Two one-way tickets to the Hogshead Inn, we're still not sure how long we'll stay, Otto said, handing over two galleons. All right, here you go, take them, go. You have twelve minutes. Just don't jump into the portal at the last minute. With the tickets in hand, Anna and Otto headed toward the portal. Approaching it, they held hands and took a step forward. When the green flames touched them, they felt a strange sensation, as if riding a water slide while standing still. And someone was preventing them from falling off this slide. After some time, 
they felt like they were standing on solid ground again and opened their eyes. The surroundings were unusual. They stood in the center of a strange circle of green flames that periodically flared up, and people appeared from it. Hey, come out, why are you standing like statues? Do you want someone to appear under your feet or land on your head? They heard and turned around. They saw a man around fifty sitting at a black wooden table, on which stood signs reading registration desk, and, as they understood, his name was Robert Williams. Realizing they were blocking the entrance, they stepped aside and went to the registration desk. Uh, sorry, it's our first time. Oh, no problem. I thought you might be among those who just want to see what happens if they keep standing at the arrival point. Merlin, if they only knew how many times I had to explain to those idiots that this is only for arrivals, and the gates are separate. Until a 200 kilogram fat guy landed on someone's head, they didn't believe it. Uh, okay, probably. Are you foreigners? How long do you want to stay in England, and what will you be doing? Yes, we're from Germany. I'm a wizard, and I want to buy a wand. As for how long we'll stay here, I'm not sure yet. It's my second time in the magical world, and we want to explore. Ah, so you're a former squib. Congratulations, buddy. You're lucky. You know, in my youth, squibs were scorned in every possible way, forget it. Since you don't know how long you'll stay here, I'll grant you permission to stay for seven days. That's the maximum I can give you without documents and a lengthy registration at the Ministry of Magic. Otto nodded. All right, sign here, and here. And give me some form of identification, muggle IDs work too. Sure, here, Otto said, handing over his driver's license and Anna's passport. Otto and Anna Nelson's, okay, I've noted your details. You can go through. Straight through the arch, and you'll come out directly into the main hall of the Hogshead Inn. I wish you a great time in England. Chapter 47, Chapter 46, The Hogshead Inn Hotel With their documents in hand, Anna and Otto headed towards the exit when they heard a shout again. You empty-headed trolls, how many times do I have to tell you? Don't stay in the center for too long. Do you want some fat ass like Dave Charpinton to land on you? Realizing that Mr. Williams wasn't addressing them this time, they continued walking. Exiting, as they understood from the sign, Arrival gate number two, they found themselves in an even larger hexagonal hall. In the middle of the hall stood a gigantic display board, comparable to what Otto had seen in Berlin Airport. Frankly, it was challenging for them to estimate the size of this area it was just enormous. If not for the continuous stream of people, they might have complained about wasting such a big space. On each face of the hexagon was an arch with a sign. For example. Departure gate number one. Departure gate number two. Arrival Gate Number 1 Reception, Hogshead Inn Exit, Hogsmeade After reading the signs, they walked across the square towards the reception area. In a couple of minutes, they arrived in an even larger hall, divided into two sections. At the entrance, there was a long hotel reception desk on the left, and on the right, a bar-slash-restaurant separated from the counter by a very wide arch. In reality, it wasn't particularly needed there as it almost didn't obstruct the view, standing there just to define the space where people ate from the entrance. Approaching the reception desk, Otto asked the man holding a peculiar-shaped beetle in his hands, Good morning. How much will a room for two cost for three days, and is it possible to extend it later? Just a moment, sir. I'll answer this call and then assist you. In the meantime, you can have free coffee or tea, just sit on the sofa to the right for incoming guests. To order coffee, press the bell. Otto nodded, though he didn't understand how someone could call on a beetle, and walked towards Anna. Let's go, dear, there's a waiting sofa over there. Anna nodded and followed Otto to the sofa. Sitting on the couch, Otto decided that free coffee could be enjoyed, in any case, he didn't know how long they'd have to wait. He noticed that behind the hotel counter, not just one person was working, but everyone had a beetle of a strange shape in their hands. Otto pressed the bell, expecting a random cup of coffee or tea to appear before him. Instead, a creature with huge eyes and a long-nosed attire appeared in front of him, dressed as a butler. More bus, pleased to serve you, sir. What do you desire? We offer 108 types of tea and 56 types of coffee. Here, please take a look, said the house elf, handing Otto the menu. Otto recognized the names of two types of tea from the list, 
and that was only because he had seen them on the news as extremely rare and expensive teas. We'll take two of these, and two sugar packets. Do you want sugar, sir? Not magical bee honey. Let's have both, Anna said to conceal her husband's embarrassment. One moment, ma'am. With a snap of Morbus the house elf's fingers, two cups of fragrant tea and a jar of honey appeared before them. To be honest, the Nelsons were afraid to touch such exquisite cups they were clearly gold-rimmed and made of an unknown material. If the gentleman and lady need anything else, you can summon me at any time by pressing the bell. I'll be delighted to assist you. Joyfully said the house elf and disappeared. And who was that? Anna said in surprise. I'm curious too, Otto replied. Honestly, in the past two days, he had been surprised so many times that it seemed the emotion of surprise might soon atrophy from overstimulation. Their contemplations were interrupted by the furious cry of a young woman behind the registration desk. Merlin's dirty underpants. Why the hell are there so many calls? I can't answer three beetle transmitters at once, I can't. I'm going to complain to the owner. I'll demand an expansion of the staff. I refuse to work under such pressure. And why so many orders for tickets to Hogwarts? Make a separate line for that. She yelled, throwing large beetles in different directions. Bzzzzz, the sound of the beetle's flight. A chubby beetle, about five to seven centimeters in length and round in shape, landed in front of Otto. Before Otto could remove it, he heard a voice coming from the beetle. Hey, are you still there? What about the ticket for the Hogwarts tour? Otto was stunned. He already understood that this was something like a muggle phone, but damn, how on earth do you even reject a call? And why did the beetle fly to him? Yes, the beetle phone was a recent purchase by Asmodeus. He bought a couple of them for 150 points each to make it easier to communicate with Grindelwald and organize the brigade. These beetles worked on the principle of pagers, but instead of an operator, there was a beetle in the middle. This way, you could communicate through them. More than that, they reproduced like crazy. They didn't even need to feed they fed on sound waves, gradually accumulating them to bring new offspring into the world. Plus, they were very easy to tame, and some people even managed to keep them as pets. The downside was that each beetle could only keep 200 so-called contacts and remember them. Although Asmodeus considered this a downside, none of his acquaintances said he had too few available contacts. So he bought a couple of powerful speakers in the muggle world and figured out how they worked. Thus, he and Nico created something like a magical speaker though playing music on it was not possible, they managed to make it produce the sounds of waves crashing against rocks. That's how the first beetle phone farm was formed, and after a couple of weeks, Asmodeus opened branches throughout England. By the way, Asmodeus noticed that these beetles were gradually evolving, so some of them could have more contacts and occasionally different shapes and colors. Otto took the beetle in his hand and tried to find something like a reset button. While he searched, he accidentally pressed the beetle on its belly and heard, call ended. Oh, interesting. How do you accept a call? Anna said. You need to pat the beetle's belly three times, replied a female voice behind her. It was the woman who asked them to wait on the couch while she finished talking. Oh, sorry. It flew to us by itself, and we decided it would be better to just end the call, considering your colleague's condition. Yes, thank you very much for that. Honestly, we can't handle such pressure. After the beetles spread across Europe, we have to deal with a couple of hundred calls a day, and sometimes several at once. On top of that, with each passing day, more and more wizards who used to be squibs come to Hogshead Inn, and we're also preparing to host the Alchemists' Congress organized by Nicholas Flamel, because of him, we're now overloaded with work. Every week, the boss hires another employee, but that's not enough. So, please forgive us for the inconvenience. I've finished the call and am ready to assist you. Regarding your questions, the price for three nights will be 20 galleons without meals. If you include a buffet, then the price will be 30 galleons for three nights. Unfortunately, I can't answer about the possibility of extending your stay. Currently, we have the last double room available, and if you don't pay for it within an hour, it may be rented to someone else. Therefore, I can't say whether you'll be able to extend your stay later. Although there's a chance that other rooms will become available, and you may move to them if absolutely necessary. Are there any other questions you'd like to ask? Not for now, but maybe later. For now, please give us a double room with meals for three nights, here are 30 galleons, Otto said, counting out 30 golden galleons from his pouch. All right, 
follow me to the registration desk. I'll check you in and give you the key to your room. The room is protected by anti-apparition magic, so no one can enter without a key. Well, except for house elves, but they've never stolen anything from a wizard in history. So your belongings will be perfectly safe, said Rose, the woman behind the registration desk. After a couple of minutes, Otto was already holding the key. If it weren't for what Rose said about the anti-apparition magic, he would never have believed that this old-style key could protect against any burglars. Follow me, said Rose, exiting the desk. Otto and Anna followed her. After passing through the restaurant-slash-bar area, they arrived at a wide staircase. Climbing to the third floor, they saw a corridor that seemed to stretch on forever. Frankly, they still couldn't grasp the size of this building. Based on what they saw inside, it felt like their hometown was smaller than this structure. Go straight down the corridor, your room is 19. For any questions, you can contact the registration desk through the Beetle phone in your room. To call, just say, connect to the registration desk, and we'll answer immediately. You can order lunch in your room, but I'd recommend having dinner downstairs. Since we're currently overwhelmed, the housekeepers can't manage to deliver dinner to the rooms. Sorry for the inconvenience, Rose explained bidding farewell to the Nelson couple. Thank you, said Otto, taking Anna's hand, and they continued down the corridor. Sixteen. Seventeen. Eighteen. Here we are, nineteen. Otto inserted the key into the lock and opened the door. The couple stood in astonishment. Was this really a double room in a hotel? Not a three-room apartment? Opening the door, they saw a huge living room, the area of just this room felt like at least eighty square meters. Beautiful and sophisticated decorations adorned the space. Not the kind you usually find in expensive hotels too flamboyant and garish but elegant and stylish. Darling, maybe we should buy an apartment in the magical world. Anna asked, sitting on the couch in the middle of the living room. I had the same thought, replied Otto. For the next half hour, Otto and Anna enjoyed the splendid room. However, they didn't forget why they came to England, to buy a magic wand and understand the magical world. Otto decided it was time to leave, it was already 13.10, and he wanted to make it to the bank before 1500 hours. Did you forget anything in the room? Otto asked, closing the door with the key. No, I have my bag with everything I need. Let's go quickly, I want to see the flying carpet Miranda mentioned. Descending again, Otto approached the registration desk. Could you tell us where the nearest parking for flying carpets is? At the exit. Turn right and walk about 150 meters. The parking is on the left. Although I'm not sure if there will be available drivers today. Otto frowned. Why do you think so? Because of the Alchemists Congress. They shuttle back and forth in search of materials and equipment. Drivers know there's no such thing as poor alchemists, so they try to serve only them. But I can order a taxi for you right from the hotel, though we charge a three-sickle commission. So the ride to Adastra shopping street will cost you 28 sickles, around 2 galleons. After some thought, Otto decided that, although he would pay a bit more, it was better than being left without transportation. He didn't want to use the portal for such a short distance. As Miranda said, it's better to enjoy the views here. Order it, here are 2 galleons. We'll wait at the entrance. All right, in a couple of minutes, a dark blue flying carpet will pick you up. I'll inform the driver about your clothing and appearance so he can recognize you. Thank you, goodbye, Otto said, heading towards Anna, who was sitting on the couch. Let's go, I've ordered a taxi since they mentioned we might not find available drivers in the parking lot. They're busy with some alchemists gathering. Oh, well, let's go, Anna said, getting up from the couch. They headed towards the exit, and upon leaving the building, they were once again astonished. Dear, doesn't it seem strange? Did we really come out of there? Yes, exactly. Then why does this building look so, disproportionate? I don't know, Otto said, entering and exiting the building. They couldn't understand why what they initially imagined as a massive hotel turned out to be more like a mansion, albeit larger than ordinary houses. But it was certainly not as extensive as it appeared from the inside, at first glance from outside, it shouldn't be more than 1,000 square meters but only the restaurant area in the middle of the hotel seemed to be over 1,000 square meters. It's the discreet expansion spell. They heard a voice from somewhere above. Raising their heads, they saw the dark blue carpet and a middle-aged man sitting on it. Are you the Nelson family? 
Yes, we are. Then I've come for you. Get on board, I'll take you quickly and safely. The man said, gradually lowering the carpet to Anna's knee height. Sitting on the flying carpet, they ascended into the air and leisurely flew towards a small village in the distance. While Anna enjoyed the scenery, Otto asked the driver about the discrete expansion spell. Actually, its application used to be strictly limited by the Ministry of Magic. But recently, it seems Fudge has been replaced, and he started passing good laws. Now you can use the discrete expansion spell as much as you want, as long as muggles don't notice you. Because of this, most wizards now live in huge houses, and the shops have become larger. You know, when I bought my wand, Ollivander's store was three times smaller, and as a child, I thought if I slammed the door hard enough, his wand boxes would collapse like a house of cards. Chapter 48, Chapter 47, The Bank Gradually approaching the village of Adastra, at an altitude of 100 meters above the ground, Otto and Anna finally got a glimpse of it. The village was built in the shape of a large circle. In the center of this circle was an enormous square paved with stone, in the middle of which burned a fire similar to the one they arrived through. To the left and right of the arrival's gate stood two departure gates. Houses surrounded the square, among which stood out a large, three-story mansion, comparable in size to the Hog's Head in where they were staying. What about that house? It clearly stands out from the others. Oh, that? That's the Morning Star family's research center. Sometimes it's closed, sometimes it's open, and sometimes wizard researchers hold meetings there. But unlike the Hog's Head Inn, it's not as large inside, though it's still not small. When it's open to the public, they exhibit all sorts of strange magical devices and new magic books for sale. In fact, the entire land on which the village is built belongs to Asmodeus Morningstar. Isn't that a monopoly? What's a monopoly? Otto realized he needed to get used to common sense in the magical world. Over the past two days, he heard the Morningstar surname so many times that now he thinks it's the most important wizarding family in the world, so he decided to ask the driver. How many members are there in the Morningstar family, and why is this family so powerful? Ha ha ha, I understand your surprise, and many people ask that, but in fact, there's only one person in the Morningstar family now. Asmodeus Norin Morningstar, the one who developed the magical rings. This 14-year-old achieved what none of the 28 sacred families could. One person? 14 years old. Astonishingly exclaimed the Nelson couple. They couldn't imagine founding a family that felt like the most important in the entire magical world at such a young age. Yes, I know. It's amazing, isn't it? In fact, Mr. Morningstar is now considered the most enviable groom in the wizarding world. Because any woman who marries him becomes a princess in the magical world. No one dares to offend the Morningstar family because he has accumulated enormous connections, and one should not underestimate former squibs. Many of them would be willing to give their lives for him. He gave them magic, something they craved all their lives. Otto and Anna nodded. They already understood the attitude towards squibs in the magical world before the magical rings. So, it's not surprising that Asmodeus gained followers. A few more minutes into the flight, the flying carpet landed in the parking lot on the outskirts of Adastra's central square. We have arrived at your destination. I know you've already paid for my services at the hotel. Thank you. I wish you a good day. Oh, wait, sir. Do you know how to get to the wand shop on Omnis's trading street? Oh, that's not far. The trading street is to the north of the village. You see, the square is surrounded by houses, but there are streets between them. You need that street over there. It's the widest. Walk 200 meters along it, and you'll find yourself on the trading street. Don't worry, you won't get lost, there are signs everywhere. The driver said and then added, if you want to exchange gold, I recommend the local bank Adastra, it's called the same. It's also owned by the Morningstar family, and they currently have the most favorable exchange rates for gold to galleons. Thank you very much. How do we get back? We heard that most drivers are busy or don't want to take anyone except alchemists. Don't worry about that. See over there. The driver pointed to something like a gigantic beetle in the form of a phone booth, to the right of the parking lot. That's a beetle telephone booth. You can ask it to connect you with the hotel administration. They'll call me or someone else to pick you up. But, as you already know, we charge a bit more than those standing on the street. Not much more. We'll probably order a taxi from the hotel when we return. Thank you very much for the advice. 
you're welcome. It's my job, I emigrated from India to England after seeing how vibrant life is here. After bidding farewell, the Nelson couple set off on their way. They kept looking around all the time, drawn to everything they saw. Although Adastra is called a village, it looks more like an ancient city. The buildings are mostly constructed in one style, resembling old Germanic architecture. Not tall but neat houses. Occasionally, you can see a tower with a pointed roof and oddly shaped clocks on it. The clock face is not mechanical, it consists entirely of a strange black flame. The hands are also made of fire, but the second hand is of red flame, while the minute and hour hands are of blue flame. It looks beautiful and entirely reflects what could be called magic. The closer they got to the trading street, the more banks and shops they saw. Dear, there's the bank the driver mentioned. Anna pointed to a four-story building clearly standing out from the general view of the street. The main part of the building was the color of mammoth bone, with black and red flame patterns on the walls. The name Magic Bank Astra was carved on one of the walls. There was no entrance on the first floor, instead, there was a staircase leading directly to the second floor and tall iron doors with two inscriptions on them. The first one read. Wealth can be found, but it's much harder to keep. Does wealth make you happy? And the second one. Is he poor who has nothing to lose? Otto and Anna didn't ponder much on these inscriptions, they thought they were there for atmosphere. Before they could knock on the door, it opened by itself. They saw a large reception area and heard a slightly excited voice. Hello, are you here by appointment or without an appointment? They saw another house elf dressed like a butler, but this one was noticeably younger, and his attire was very elegant. They didn't know that just two months ago, wizards would have considered this house elf insane. Asmodeus decided to hire those house elves who had been abandoned by their previous owners. He told them that if they wanted to work for him, they would have to wear the uniform he provided. Also, Asmodeus had a hard time convincing the elves to accept a salary. He pays them ten galleons a week. He wanted to give more, as he does not support slavery, but they outright refuse. You might think that Asmodeus enslaved those first ten thousand squibs. But in reality, the contract of loyalty to the Morning Star family clearly specifies the payment for their work. They earn very well. As for the house elves, Asmodeus treated them the same way. Instead of simple words of submission, the elves signed a contract with Asmodeus they would serve him on his terms. Asmodeus' terms were clothing, salary, and self-respect. Thus, around 300 house elves currently work for Asmodeus in various shops and enterprises of the Morning Star family. In fact, he wants to verify his suspicions about house elves. He and Nicholas found records that the entire race was enslaved by a witch in ancient times. That's why now, they look like this. Although they used to look completely different. Asmodeus and Nicholas are trying to find a way to lift the curse. Of course, not for all house elves, only for those who signed a contract with Asmodeus. That's why only house elves work in this bank branch. He decided not to deal with goblins. Let the goblins and the bankers from the muggle world compete with each other. For now, he will develop his banking system. Uh, we don't have an appointment. We came to exchange gold for galleons, Otto said. Oh, I understand. Please proceed to the hall to your right. There will be four currency exchange desks. Can I help you with anything else? The house elf said, still excited. No, thank you. We don't have any questions for now. You're welcome. It is an honor for a house elf to help wizards. Feel free to approach me anytime. Otto and Anna nodded and headed into the hall to the right of the registration desk. They entered a white hall with four long tables. Behind each table sat two house elves who were actively calculating, weighing, assessing, and so on. They found an available spot, and a house elf gestured for them to approach. Sitting down, Otto said, Good afternoon, I need to exchange gold for galleons. Good afternoon, respected wizard. How much gold do you have, approximately by weight? The house elf asked. I brought 500 grams of pure 999 gold with me. These were Otto's savings from the past year, he had initially planned to spend them on a trip to Bali. Then I can give you 6,580 galleons. You can check the exchange rate in other banks, but I can assure you that we have the best exchange rate in the entire magical world. Proudly stated the house elf, who clearly held himself in higher regard than other house elves they had seen. I know you have a good exchange rate. I agree to this exchange, Otto replied. The house elf nodded and opened a drawer in the table 
from which a voice emanated, how much? 6,580, and a bag with the undetectable extension charm on it, replied the elf. Ah, bloodsuckers! Grumbled the voice, and a pouch with money was spat out. This alchemical creature, accidentally created by Nicholas, was essentially a living box, but to put it mildly, it was quite greedy. Taking the pouch with money in hand, the elf placed it on magical scales, which immediately determined the amount of money in the bag. Ensuring everything was in order, the elf opened another box containing stacks of documents, reminiscent of muggle checks. Handing Otto a form for completing the currency purchase agreement, the elf inquired, Mr., do you have any form of identification? Muggle documents are acceptable. Otto nodded and handed over his driver's license. The sound of a pen writing on paper was heard. 6580. Otto Nelson, mumbled the elf to himself. Finishing writing, he snapped his fingers, and an identical copy of the form appeared to the right of the original. Handing the original to Otto, the house elf said, Thank you for using our services. I would like to offer you the opportunity to open an account with us. By becoming a client of our bank, you will receive our Astra card. If you deposit more than 5,000 galleons, we will also offer you a 6.18% annual interest rate. Otto was surprised by such a high percentage but decided to ask, what does the Astra card offer? Oh, many things. Firstly, you can make purchases in the city of Adastra and all establishments owned by the Morningstar family using the card, and you won't have to carry a large sum with you. Additionally, the ticket price for passing through the portal to the village of Adastra from any gate-equipped point in the world will be reduced from one galleon to one sickle. Also, in the case of limited sales of Mr. Morningstar's research results, you will be in the first group of interest. All right, let's deposit 5,000 galleons into the account. I hope I'll have enough for purchases today with the remaining 1580, Otto said. You don't need to worry about that. The average salary in the magical world today is 100 galleons per month. In fact, muggle wizards and squibs who have become wizards are now considered a wealthy group among wizards. If you're not buying a vehicle or real estate, it will be difficult for you to spend more than 200 galleons at a time, explained the house elf. Okay, then let's deposit 5,500 into the account. I'll leave the rest in cash. Five minutes later, Otto rejoined Anna, who was waiting on the couch with the card in his hands. It was a black card with a gold border, the name Otto Nelson written in the middle, and the number 5. The number indicated the client's level, with a total of 7 levels. Accumulating more than 5,000 allowed the client to advance to the 5th level. Wow, what's this? Anna asked. That's what wizarding bank cards look like, Otto said, boasting. But before he could celebrate, Anna snatched the card from his hands and tucked it into her chest pocket. It definitely won't get lost, and you won't spend all the money, she said. Otto's heart was broken but then he remembered a good thing. The card was linked to him through blood. Anna couldn't spend the money without him. Haha, I love magic. Having finished their business at the bank, Otto and Anna stepped back onto the street. Dear, turn right there. That's the beginning of the shopping street. Let's go quickly, Anna said, pulling Otto along. Chapter 48, Omnis Trading Street Wow, how beautiful! Anna exclaimed excitedly paying no mind to the curious glances from passers-by. Otto, found himself pleasantly surprised. While the village had always possessed a certain beauty, it used to be half-empty, lacking liveliness. Now, they see stretched an incredibly long street, its end unseen. As they glanced around, sharp towers emerged behind houses like mushrooms after rain. A broad pedestrian path, paved with stones, led the way. The houses and shops showcased traditional Germanic architecture with a touch of modern flair. Various goods were displayed for sale, peculiar creatures, herbs, brooms, cauldrons, and even ordinary food items. Numerous people, clad in diverse attire, filled the scene. Some wore everyday modern clothing, while others resembled druids fresh from the forest, adorned with plants and tree bark. Nearby stood a plump woman wrapped in a red woolen garment. In the distance, the voices of merchants and customers echoed. Come closer, new puff skein litter. Approach and acquire an adorable pet for yourself. Only five galleons. Nifflers for our sale. The latest litter of the best household creature for passive income. Come and purchase these youngsters, they tame well. Fire crab for sale, just arrived from Fiji, don't pass by. Licensed for breeding, fire crab with all the paperwork. 
Shrivelfig, Aconetum, Screech Snap, Sopaphorus Plant, Fang Geranium, Chinese Chomping Cabbage, Mandrake, Bellis, any plants of your choice. Approach, don't walk by. Discount on Chinese Chomping Cabbage. Brooms. Flying Brooms. Broomsticks. Family Brooms, Sports Brooms, Toy Brooms, all kinds. Nimbuses of all generations. Don't miss the chance to buy a broom for your child. Pay no attention to those single-seater brooms. I have flying carpets for sale. Come and buy. Just arrived from a grubba. Buy flying carpets. Reject these outdated contraptions. For sale, flying motorcycles. Available with and without sidecar. Come and it will take you to the ends of the earth. Potion cauldrons. Cast iron, copper. All types. Approach. Don't pass by. We have used and new ones. Pest Control Agency. Getting rid of pesky garden gnomes has never been easier. Tell us your address and make a down payment. The next day, all pests will disappear. We provide a two-month guarantee. Potions. Potions for women. Everlasting eyelashes, fairy spark dust, ten-second pimple vanisher, love is blind eye serum, cure for boils, Dr. Ubley's oblivious unction, any potions of your choice to charm your favorite wizard. We don't sell love potions. Only natural love. A branch of St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries has opened on Omnis Trade Street. All those affected by magic, come to us for treatment. The best magical healers will assist you. Honey Dukes has opened a branch on Omnis Trade Street. Come and buy your favorite sweets. Without sweets, life is not joyful. Florian Fortescue's Ice Cream Parlor is now on Omnis Trade Street. Come and indulge in your favorite ice cream. Madame Poudafoot's Tea Shop has opened a new branch. Calling all couples to join us. Here, no one will disturb you. A new branch of your favorite cafe, Rosalie Tea Bag. Come and enjoy some butterbeer. Herbicides of all kinds. Come and purchase. Don't walk by. Two galleons per bottle. Two galleons. It's daylight robbery. Well then, brew it yourself if you're so clever. Otto and Anna joyfully strolled down the street. Occasionally, Anna would dash into a shop and peruse the available goods. Each of these dashes terrified Otto to death. He hoped she wouldn't find out that she couldn't use the card without him. Moving further down the street, Otto stopped as he felt Anna pulling him by the hand. What's going on? Anna didn't answer but pointed to the magical creature's shop. Do you really want to get a pet? Yes, I didn't want to get a dog because they are big, and cats shed, let's see what they have to offer. Let's go, maybe we'll really get a pet. Ding, ding, the sound of bells. The door opened, and behind the counter, a young man's voice was heard. Hello, would you like to buy food for your pet? Or are you looking for a companion? Magical creatures make the best pets, they're three times smarter than muggle animals. My wife wants to see what you have. Can we do that? Of course, you can. Why not? I'm happy to entrust these little ones to kind hands for a certain fee. Do you have any preferences regarding the appearance of the animal? The main thing is that it's not too big and doesn't shed. Hmm, come follow me, I think I know what you're looking for, said the seller, stepping out from behind the counter and heading deeper into the store. Otto and Anna followed him, observing magical creatures. Don't worry, each animal's cage had an undetectable extension charm, ensuring they lived in the most comfortable conditions. On their way, they saw the strangest beings. Something resembling a patch of greenish fungus with eyes, which the seller called Boondimun. A large cat, Neasel. A peculiar frog sitting on a tree like a monkey, Clabbert. Even an ordinary hedgehog, but the seller said it was a gnarl and didn't like being fed. They also saw a massive aquarium with a silvery fish swimming in it they were told it was a Raymora, highly valued by sailors. A brightly pink bird whooper caught Anna's eye, but the seller mentioned that its singing gradually drives people insane. After that, Anna and Otto decided to just follow the seller to ensure nothing happened to them. After a couple of minutes, they stopped at two enclosures. One was labeled Puff Skins, and the other Niffler. I think both of these animals suit you, but I highly recommend Puff Skins. Why specifically him? Can you tell us about both options? Of course. Puffskins is a harmless creature found worldwide. Its body is spherical and covered with soft, cream-colored fur that doesn't shed. At least, 
I've never heard of it. Puffskins are low maintenance, don't mind being petted or tossed in the air when happy, and purr quietly. Occasionally, they extend a very long, narrow pink tongue and use it to search the entire house for food. Puffskins are omnivores, scavenging anything from leftovers to spiders. They especially enjoy sticking their tongue into the nostrils of sleeping wizards and eating boogers. That's why children love puffskins, that's why they're happily kept in magical families. I consider them the perfect pet for a young couple. They require minimal care, maybe a bath once a week they like that. Also, they usually find their own food. You don't need any ministry license for their care and breeding. In short, the best pet for beginners. Otto nodded, thinking it was a suitable pet for them, but he still wanted to inquire about Niffler. Nifflers look much like a cross between a duck-billed platypus and a mole. But they're quite mischievous. They inhabit Britain, and goblins often tame them, teaching them to find treasures in the ground. Nifflers are affectionate but should not be kept indoors it's destructive to furniture. They live in burrows up to 20 feet deep. So, if you don't have a separate piece of land and aren't prepared for valuable items to disappear constantly, I don't recommend taking one. They are usually bought by wealthy wizards with large homes and gardens or treasure hunters. Weighing the pros and cons, Anna and Otto decided that the seller was right. Puffskins would be more suitable for them. So Otto said, can you open the cage? We want to choose the one we like the most. Yes, of course. After Anna petted all the puffskins in the enclosure, she wanted to buy all of them. Otto, however, thought it was going too far. Let's just take this one. It was the first to climb onto your hands, and it has a beautiful heart-shaped pattern on its belly. While Anna didn't want to leave all the puff skins, she understood that they couldn't keep 30 of them immediately. You might think she's spoiled, but she just sometimes likes being a little girl that Otto persuades it makes her feel like a princess. Yes, let's take this one, it's so soft, oh oh. Puff skin, Omega. All right, how much does it cost? Eight galleons. The mother of these little ones won the award for the fluffiest fur in the Wizarding Pets magazine, so the price is slightly higher. Okay, here are eight galleons. Will you feed him leftovers, or do you want to buy him food? What food do you suggest? We have a magical feed that simulates the movements of beetles, but they won't crawl out of the bowl. The price is two galleons per kilogram. Give me one kilo, here are another two galleons. Ding, ding the sound of bells. Otto and Anna finished their purchases at the magical pet store. In addition to the feed, Otto bought a special bag for puffskin and a bowl. Anna was very happy, and Otto watched her with a smile on his face, pleased as well. So, now with their new companion, they gradually made their way towards the store with the sign Olawander on it. Chapter 49, Olivander Ding, ding, the bells chimed. Anna and Otto stepped into the shop. They couldn't quite gauge its depth as the lighting dwindled the farther in they looked. Yet, they beheld hundreds of shelves filled with small boxes. The only thing unsettling them was the absence of a shopkeeper. Otto contemplated calling out to someone loudly. However, before he could start, a dry voice echoed from the depths of the store, Oh, visitors, I'm coming, wait a moment. After a while, they saw an elderly wizard with large grey-blue eyes that seemed to peer straight into the soul. His hands were dry and calloused, with long fingers that might have been fit for playing the piano. He was dressed in the standard wizard's robe, burgundy or brown, with an embroidered ring-shaped design over his heart, signifying the wand shop. Observing the appearance of the old man, Anna, who held a card received from a chocolate frog, covered her mouth in astonishment. Are you Garrick Olivander? But aren't you supposed to be in the Diagon Alley shop? She was extremely surprised. You see, for those who grew up in the magical world from birth, Olivander is just the owner of the shop where magical wands are sold. How should I put it, an important and well-known person might stop seeming so special after you've seen him a couple of hundred times. But Anna and Otto were different. Just before entering the wand shop, Anna bought a chocolate frog. And she got Garrick Olivander. Here's what was written on his card. Mr. Olivander is arguably the best wand maker in the world, and many foreigners come to London specifically to buy a wand crafted by him. Mr. Olivander grew up in this family business, showing his talent very early on. His ambitions extend to studying the characteristics of wand cores and woods to find the perfect combination and create the ideal wand. Before Mr. Olivander took over the family business, wizards used a variety of substances as magical cores for their wands. 
Clients often provided the master with something particularly precious or a source of family pride as the magical core for their wand. Mr. Olivander, being a purist, always insisted that a good wand couldn't be made using the hair of the client's favorite nasal, or a sprig of didony that once saved the client's father from poisoning, or a strand of hair from a kelpie's mane encountered by the client in Scotland, unless paired with the client's favorite wood. According to Mr. Olivander, the best wands are a combination of a strong magical core and a carefully chosen wooden casing, all tailored to the characteristics of the future owner, allowing the wand to unleash its full power in the hands of its wielder. Initially, this revolutionary discovery faced resistance, but it soon became clear that Ollivander's wands far surpassed all others. His methods of finding the right wood for the casing and selecting a suitable magical core for creating a wand perfectly suited to its owner are closely guarded secrets and the envy of all competitors. A distinctive feature is that he remembers all the wands he has ever produced and recalls which wand went to whom. This was a card from a limited edition. Asmodeus allocated funds to the chocolate frog manufacturer. Now, they don't just feature brief summaries of the achievements of the greatest wizards but also those recognized by the magical world for their craftsmanship, research, skills, etc. So people would know those who deserve respect. He decided to increase the level of education among young people and newcomers to the magical world. In any case, these frogs are cheap, and most people entering the magical world will decide to buy and try local sweets. It's a win-win situation. Ha ha ha, for the first time. I see someone so excited to meet me. I like you, young lady. Too bad you're not a witch, yet. The last word he said silently to himself. Actually, I've decided to move my main shop here. My little old shop will be managed by my daughter, Lisa Ollivander. There are many more people here, and I can encounter more interesting combinations. She'll have time to practice interacting with customers. Even though Diagon Alley is not as popular as it used to be, a good number of wizards from England still visit. All right, young folks, I've talked enough about myself. Today, as I understand it, you've come for a wand, young man. Said Garrick, addressing Otto. Yes, Mr. Ollivander, you're correct. My name is Otto Nelson I used to be a squib. This is my wife, Anna. That's wonderful. Every time, I'm so delighted to see new faces in the wizarding world. Although, after this kid Asmodeus invented magical rings, I had to involve my son and daughter in the business. I'm very pleased with this influx of customers in my old age. Mr. Nelson, which hand do you usually use? I'm right-handed. Right-handed, good. Extend your arm, I need to take some measurements. Otto watched as a tape measure flew out from Ollivander's sleeve and meticulously measured him height, arm span, distance between nostrils, finger length, and so on. While the tape measure did its work, Ollivander recorded the data in a 10x10 table, making it easier to find a suitable wand. Anna observed the process with keen interest. After some period of time, Ollivander pointed to the corner to the right of Anna, saying, Wait a couple of minutes, you can sit on the couch over there. I need to retrieve some potential matches. Ollivander returned after a short while, accompanied by five to seven boxes of various lengths levitating behind him. Placing the boxes on the table and removing their lids, Ollivander motioned for Otto to come closer. Here, try the first one you like. I need to understand where to go from here. If you were a child, I would personally give you the first one to try. But I've noticed that the older former squibs get, the more challenging it is to find the right wand. I don't know if it's because a person's personality develops gradually, and the wands don't have enough time to adapt but the ones I've sold to adults seem to fit them even better than the ones I sell to children. Just remember, the wand chooses the wizard, Mr. Nelson, not the other way around. Otto glanced at the boxes on the table and decided to pick one at random. Perhaps it was the appearance of the wand that drew him in. He reached for a box. Ollivander observed his movements and commented. Vine wood, 12.5 inches, dragon heartstring core. Powerful and flexible. Ollivander was about to continue his explanation when Otto waved the wand, and a sound of explosion echoed. Quickly taking the wand from Otto, Ollivander said, This one is not suitable. Try this one. Willow wood, 13 inches, unicorn tail hair core. Very stable and faithful. Otto took the wand again and waved it. A light appeared at the wand's tip, but it quickly vanished. It fits, but not perfectly. Ollivander took the wand from Otto once again. Placing two wands back into their respective boxes, 
Ollivander slid two boxes toward Otto. One box contained a shiny, jet black wand, polished to perfection, while the other held a reddish brown wand with a dragon pattern at the tip. Choose for yourself, I believe both of them will suit you. Otto thought for a moment and reached for the coal black wand, feeling that it resonated with him more. Observing Otto's choice, Ollivander commented, Hmm, 13.5 inches of beechwood with a unicorn hair core. An interesting choice. The beech wand is ideally suited for a young but wise person beyond their years, or a knowledgeable and experienced adult. Beech wands are not favored by those who are narrow-minded or impatient. Such wizards, upon receiving a beech wand, often seek out knowledgeable wand makers, like myself, demanding an explanation as to why their beautiful wands lack power. However, a properly matched beech wand can achieve a level of skill and artistry rarely seen in wands of other woods, hence their shining reputation. As for the core, unicorn hair produces the most resilient magic and is less susceptible to fluctuations and blockages than other cores. Wands with unicorn hair are the least likely to turn to dark arts. They are the most loyal of all cores, usually maintaining a strong bond with their owner, whether the owner is a seasoned wizard or a beginner. A slight downside to unicorn hair is that it doesn't provide the most powerful wands, although this can be compensated for by the wood used for the wand. They are also prone to melancholy if mistreated meaning the hair can die, requiring replacement. I promptly turn away those whose core dies and refuse to serve them in the future. Hearing this, Otto waved his wand, and a spring breeze gently wafted through the store. Anna joyfully applauded at the sight. Your wand has chosen you. Please treat it with respect and don't consider it merely a tool. It's your loyal companion that will never betray you. Yes, I'll treat it like my second wife. Hey! Otto exclaimed, feeling a nudge to his leg. What second wife are you talking about? It's just for comparison, of course, I won't trade you for a wand. I meant I'll take good care of it. Hmm, Anna smirked. Mr. Ollivander, how much do I owe you for the wand? Forty-five galleons for sincerity. Would you like to buy a set of oils and brushes for wand care? It's an additional five galleons. Yes, please. Here's fifty galleons. Thank you very much for your purchase. I hope to see you unlock the potential of this wand in the future and not waste such fine craftsmanship. Don't worry, I won't disappoint. Thanks again. You're welcome. After bidding farewell to Ollivander, Otto and Anna headed towards the door, but before they reached the door they heard. Ding. Ding. Sound of the bells ringing. Thanks for listening.